Well, hello. Well, hello. Well, hello, Mike Manley. <laughs> hello. Well, hello. Hello. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Pencil to Pencil, your favorite pandemic podcast. Proudly pronounced in, uh, I can't do it. <laughs> Proudly brought to you by, by Pencils. By pencils. By pencils <laughs> nice, Incorporated. Nice save. Um, all right. Let me give a shout out to our sponsors. Uh, Yes, you guys, it's correct. Graphicsly, the people that make Clip Studio Paint are our real sponsors. That's because we're legit. So when we give you guys the word, you know the word is bond. Bird. <laughs> Yo, what's the price? Two bits <laughs> twice. <laughs> I love being old, man. This is great. Uh, also, Pencil to Pencil is brought to you by our good buddy John Morrow over at Tomorrow's Publishing. Uh, our fine publisher of Draw Magazine, um, Rough Stuff, uh, Lego Brick Journal, The Kirby Collector, on and on and on. Sharp uh, bricks, hard bricks, short bricks. All them bricks. <laughs> um, guys, come on into the uh, chat. Uh, if you're watching uh, live on YouTube or Facebook, uh, type into the comments, say hello, tell us where you're watching us from, and maybe you'll be part of the show. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe. So, also, if anybody is watching for the first time, hello. Uh, the way this works is that I co host Jamar, am going to, uh, with the help of Mike, interview our guest, and I'm going to keep my eye on the chat. All right, well, I, I, don't, so, I just thought I'd just sit around, I didn't know I did actually work. Well, you can sit back, I'll, I'll handle this one, and um. If anybody, I love banter. I love a good, lively chat room. But I also know, Mike, that a lot of times the chat goes quiet because they're listening, right? They're they're listening to what we're no talking about. No listening. <laughs> the first rule of, of pencil to pencil is no listening. <laughs> that goes over well with our boot camps. So That's you right. Yeah. Been you two know. hours drawing and nobody just, paid attention. Just looking, but no listening. <laughs> so. Um, I'd like to introduce my uh, good friend, best bud, and modern master of comic books, Mike Manley. Say hey, Mike. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm going to stop introducing you. <laughs> um, and also, uh, if you're new to the the the, the podcast, uh, our third co-host, uh, Brett Blevins. Uh, Kind of will show up from time to time, so uh, I don't know if Brett will be joining us tonight. But uh, I don't know if he, he, this is a uh, special week, so oh, okay, all right. Well, I'm... Is, is in the life of a single man, and I will say no more than that. Say no more, because we spill no tea on pencil to pencil. That's right. Uh, but so coffee, but no tea. <laughs> so I want to get right to this because we got a we got a really special guest in the green room. Uh, who may be eating all of our <laughs> our MMs right now? Uh, ooh, actually, we have a, a twofer, which is even cooler. Um, our old best bud, Mike Avon Oming, is in the is in the green room, and also uh, the illustrious illustrator and uh, uh, married couple Taki Soma is also floating around in the background. So maybe we'll talk to both of them, or one of them, or maybe well, uh, hopefully one of them. Tonight, so we get a maybe one, maybe. So uh, we're real excited to catch up with with these guys, see what they've been into, and also we'll probably talk about the air conditioning, air conditioning, the air conditioning out in the West Coast, which is really messed up. All right, so let's bring them in. Hey, Mike. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Hi. How are you guys doing? Hey, how are you? It's hard to it's hard to drink your sprite through a through a mask. Like <laughs> oh, you know, in these days you just gotta figure stuff out. You know, I figure I'm only about two feet away from you right now, so we should keep the social distancing safe and, and everything. Well, you know, I I respect that. Thank you. Thanks for Honestly, I, I've been waiting for this to happen for so long. Like I'm I'm, I'm not a real germaphobe, but just enough. Like I've definitely been on planes with, with the mask and everything. So I, I you know, kind of hope it doesn't go away because I, I have a strong imagination for invisible things that threaten me. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, but, well, you know, and not to get too like, you know, Black Mirror about stuff, but it's like, I remember thinking back when the world wasn't like this to like, well, like we just go to places and cram into a room and get like breathed on by people. If I was another person, I'd probably be wigged out by that. You know what yeah. I mean? And now we're in a place where people are just kind of like, you stay over there. Maybe it should have been like this in the beginning, you know? I, I don't know. Not everybody's you stay over there. Some people just like get right in your space. They're like, yeah, that's they, super true. They're like, they're like totally oblivious to the whole thing. Yeah. I don't, I don't get out anyway. Like, I, I mean, I know that's a standard thing for comic book people to say, um, but I think even less so. Um, I mean, we were talking just before. For this, one of the reasons why I haven't seen other views, I, I hardly do cons anymore at all. Um, when I do do them, there maybe every two years I'll do one. Do do, <laughs> um, do do, like, yeah, do do. Um, so like, I just don't see people. You know, we just typically don't see people. Um, and then some other things that happen in our life, from like uh, uh, Taki got MS or was diagnosed with MS, so like that stopped us from going out for a long time as we kind of figure out the new normal. Mm-hmm. And we were literally getting ready to get to that space. Like I was, I was getting ready to like, you know, it's time to do cons again. Like I've really been away. So this is, you know, this would be kind of fresh territory. And we had yeah. our eyes on Dragon Con. So this is our first con. We were, we were going to try like traveling and stuff. Um, you know, haven't figured out like how to kind of deal with the, the MS stuff and travel and all of that. And then this happened and it's like, God, this happened the COVID stuff. And then just recently with the fires, it's just, it's like triple quadruple double downing on isolation. Um, which is why when you asked me to come on, I was like, please. Yes. <laughs> well, something, I'm else to, something, something else to do. That's right. Yeah. The groundhog. Besides, day thing besides like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mike, have you, I mean, uh, I think- go ahead, Mike. No, no, go ahead. Uh, since uh, there's always like a thousand mics on this show, I'll call you by your last names. It might make it a little easier. So, Omi, have you picked up any uh, any different uh, entertainment habits from being kind of like locked into your house? Like, have you started listening to podcasts or watching like old European movies or anything like that? Are you just working as usual? Yeah, it's just the work, the working. You know, um, I I mean, I was thinking about this earlier a couple weeks ago. Um, some habits are hard to break, you know, especially like creative and artistic habits. Um, I was listening to your interview with Mike Hawthorne just before this, and you know, I'm familiar with his story coming up and stuff. And I was thinking about how, because I was focused at a very young age on becoming a comic book artist, um, mm-hmm. I, I began. As, I didn't know I was hustling at the time, but you know, it was always this hustle to like get your first gig yeah. and then you know maintain that gig, and then you're hustling while you have that gig to look out for other jobs and stuff, and like. That sort of, and then once I really got into more creator own stuff, that self perpetuating, like creating work and looking for that next thing, it just never stopped. So, like, even, you know, literally 30 something years later, I can't relax. <laughs> like, I wish I could, you know, like the yeah. idea of sitting down to, like, this is a great shame of mine, but especially since I've stopped flying, like, I hardly really read anymore, like, read an actual book. Flying was the time I would like, give myself to like you know read and like now like i start reading i i feel the clock ticking in my head these are pages that could be done Mm -hmm. um i tend to work myself till i'm mentally and physically exhausted so like when i i have the time then i don't want to do anything i don't want to even television shows like we'll talk about not watching something too challenging (laughs) but nothing boring enough to completely ignore either like you don't want like Sometimes we'll look at a show like, wow, that looks great and dark. So yeah, we'll wait for a while or it's just, it's too intense, you know, cause like you've spent yourself, you've literally spent yourself to the point of uh, you're just done with everything. So when it comes to the idea of discovering new things, new new ways to entertain ourselves, mm-hmm. uh, it's, it's that, I think the closest thing is um, we discovered fat free Nilla wafers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, snacks are our big escape yeah. now. Like yeah. working and snacking. How dare you! <laughs> <laughs> now yeah. there'll be a big now there'll be a big run on them at Amazon. That's right. Yeah, you just <laughs> you just messed up the Nilla wafer market. I hope you're happy with yourself. Well, this is what's amazing. Right? It's going to be a commercial for the Nilla wafers now because <laughs> the fat-free ones taste 
ninety percent like the, the regular one. So like, yeah, we've been just getting down on that and like yogurt ice cream and I was eating so much apple pie a week. Yeah, because of our cholesterol, so we have to look out. Yeah, I was literally eating a full apple pie a week for so long. I thought at some point I was getting pre-diabetic, and I literally went to get my blood test to make sure it wasn't. And I wasn't like, all right, back to apple pie a week. <laughs> you said your, your A1C numbers are vanilla ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even a number anymore. That's great. Yeah, I remember seeing that one, I think, on your Twitter. You were talking about eating. I, I thought you were joking, but you're legit eating apple pie every like every week. Yeah. Um, and we eat relatively healthy during the daytime. Then yeah. the night is just the Jekyll and Hyde thing, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was that? <laughs> uh, speak for myself, like you said. <laughs> no, you know what? Yeah. It, it's a recurring question that I always ask because we always get the same answer is, do you know how to relax? And I don't know a lot of cartoonists who know what that means because yeah. if it's not that you're busy, it's that your brain is kind of like always moving like a hummingbird, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and especially like, yeah, if, if you're like the three of us, like you're really generating your own, your own income. It is this constant, like, this is my gig now, what's the next gig? And then like even looking for like work for higher stuff, um, it's, it's unpredictable how long that may or may not take. Um, in fact, I've had like this sort of list of projects and like Tyke and I have been going over them to figure out like, what is the priority of, of things right now, you know, um, like we had just obviously finished up powers and I just finished up another murder ink arc. So right now my schedule is like all the creator owned stuff that I want to do, but you know, you have to juggle all these weird math in your head. There's like, there's a bunch of projects you want to do. There's a mm -hmm. bunch of projects you have completely written, right. But they're not really drawn yet. There's other stuff that's kind of drawn and mostly written. Like there's all this sort of like, equations of like, well, what have I already invested time in? What do you think is commercially feasible? What do you think people want? What is a project that's a passion project? What is one that I think can sell? Like all these equations and stuff and like there. So you're sitting there working on your, your, your priority stuff, but you're constantly thinking about, it's almost like a hunter gatherer mentality, right? Yeah. Yeah. You're eating, yeah. You're eating that deer and you're thinking, where's that deer coming from? You know? <laughs> But you want, you, want, you want to make sure that there's there's always more deer. No matter how much deer you're full with, you just keep thinking like, I gotta find another deer. Yeah. <laughs> you know what's what's it, it's it's uh, I think it's a byproduct to. I mean, it might be naturally be your your personality might be that type of of uh, on. So some people are like that, but I'm the same way. Like if I want go on a vacation. I just don't want to, I would like not want to lay on a beach. I would want to paint the beach. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? I would, to me, that would be relaxing, but yeah. just like That's to sit there and lay on the beach would be like the most boring. It'd be like doing math or something, you know, it'd just be <laughs> like, like it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be any, any, uh, any fun. And I think because you train your brain or maybe it's, it's the comics thing where you have to train your brain to tell a story so your brain is always finding stories yeah you're paying attention to the world around you you're seeing these people over here do something and that kind of goes into that oh your your you know your brain starts taking that and processing totally like like you say like even if you get on an airplane what's those people's story what's that guy yeah. over there what's that lady over there you know, yeah. uh, or and like I would sketch in the airport, you know, you would do a little sketch of people. Definitely. You know? yeah. And part and, of it is the nature of comics, which is like, it's, it's not always like this, but it's typically like how many pages can you get done this week or this day? Right. So you're always thinking about that, getting that, that next amount of work. Like how can I maximize the day? Like on a good day, I'm doing two pages a day. Mm -hmm. I haven't done that in a, in, a, in a while. Partially I'm getting older and partially like all the crazy stuff. It's just hard to concentrate and stuff. Yeah. Um, but that mentality is always there. Get another page in another panel, do another layout. And I know this sounds like, oh, poor us. This is part of who we are. We like it for as much as it sounds like, uh, you know, a little bitching about it. Like it's, it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's who we are, you know? Um, so there's this weird balance of like, it's always this mental health game of like, you don't want to squish that, 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 
that need to do those things because that is truly who we are. You just don't want it to get out of control. Yeah. Um, and yeah. now it's just hard because, like I just said, literally, it's like, you know, uh, MS, COVID, lockdown with windows, fires around us, and windows shut. Like, it's the hardest Groundhog Day experience. <laughs> you know, like I, I hate getting up for breakfast because I know, like, it's that reset. It's the beginning of that reset button, you know. Mm -hmm. And every day you read the news, it's like one, like a new supervillain yep. has just taken over the airwaves. It's like, though today this this asshole was just appointed to this. Today yeah. this thing was repealed. Today this vaccine test failed. It's just like, you know, part of it is that it's all going away. He told us it's uh, right, right, yeah, it's going away and it's going to get cooler out. But. I suppose if you look back in history, I mean, you look at the guys who started out in comics, like guys like Kirby and people like that, that generation, I mean, they went into a war and they had no idea what was going to happen. They didn't know yeah. whether they were going to defeat Hitler. There was a lot of people who didn't want us to get into war, you know? Um, yeah. So, you history know, you talk comfort, you know, like the, the, the one thing that, for as bad as things are now, um, I think about the, the 1970s. And like, we have a lot of the similar things going on, but it was worse. I mean, people were, you know, being assassinated, like literal assassinations on a regular basis, you know, mm -hmm. on top of cities burning, on top of economic collapses and stuff. And, and somehow we made it, and, and huge government corruption. Like there's so many great documentaries about, you know, what was going on in the 70s. And it's kind of amazing that that we didn't fall apart then. Um, so. I predict I predict there will be great films about government corruption <laughs> in, mm -hmm. in the future. It'll yeah. probably just be the government corruption channel. <laughs> be nothing, nothing but 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 uh, pandemic corruption. You yeah. know, Washington corruption. Um, yeah. You know, but and, and that does leak into your mind. Also, because our job is to take anything like, I mean, you could sit down and imagine this, right? You could imagine there being a terrorist attack. You could sit down and imagine there being a pandemic or anything. It's part of our job is to imagine some world where some something terrible went wrong and there's a ragtag group of people. I mean, so much of our fiction. Wolverines! <laughs> right, yeah. right, you know? Um, and I always think, like, when, when I'm thinking about this stuff, or I'll talk to a friend, or I'll talk to Brett, or I'll talk to Jamar, it's like, if I can think of this, I'm, just, I'm a cartoonist, right? So there's other people whose job it is required to think of this yeah. stuff. You know, mm -hmm. but it's like you can't turn your you can't turn that or it's hard to turn that part of your brain off. I find what I do is I listen to audio books, especially in the evening. I don't watch. I watch. I'm actually watching less news. Oh, yeah. Me reading, too. reading more and listening to audio books. Because anything that happens, you can you can read it. Right. Yeah, you're not any headlines, even if you try, you know, um, I've definitely gotten to a place where the news has stopped bothering me. You know, um, like I know everything is bad. Um, I, I'm not like dipping out, you know, um, I, I still, you know, I just get some basic headline news, but I've stopped living in it, you know, which I was doing for a long time, you know, um, cause you have on some level, you have to protect your, your, your own psyche over this stuff, you know, um, and, uh, take some effort, but, but I've gotten there. Um, and it's made social media a lot better, you know, it's made, just dealing with that stuff a lot easier it, and, and it took me a long time to get there. Um, but, yeah, but, but I got there. And so now it's just like priority right now is, is super selfish. It's taking care of, of, of Taki, taking care of uh, my son best I can from the other side of the country. Um, and our close friends, which are, which are basically our extended family, you know, mm -hmm. um, and the rest is like, do what you can where you can, but like, I just got to focus on, 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 on yourself a little bit. It's, it sounds selfish, but right. well, you you. I mean, it's just it's survival, so it's not really selfish. You know what I mean? If you yeah, yeah. If, you can, if you can't function, and everybody has a different level. Because I I friends with 
older people and younger people and people who are comic painters and animators and sculptors yeah. and a lot of creative musicians and a lot of people are having a hard time uh, compartmentalizing, which is what yeah. you're talking about, um, because they've yeah. never experienced anything like that before. And I'm old enough to have experienced really bad things when I was a kid, like the riots in Detroit. So for me, not being able to go outside and things being dangerous is kind of an echo of a lot of the things that I experienced as a kid living in a, in a bad neighborhood for for mm. for for many years so it's it it's not odd right yeah. it kind of is kind of familiar in a way um and even people being angry is sort of familiar because you go back at the late 60s early 70s even though i was a, just i was just a kid there were a lot of angry people yeah you know yeah. there was a lot a lot of angry people i think the difference is is that everybody didn't have a bullhorn with the social media. So yeah. everybody's angry voice ag uh, magnifies the other angry voices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's hard. And it sucks that I've lost well, maybe two or three friends, not over politics, but their behavior online didn't line up with the person that I knew. Right. You know, um, yeah. the person that I was that I was pals with. This isn't like super close friends because you could work that shit out. But that these are like you know acquaintances. In and the parking lot, you work that out. Yeah. You, well, you can just have a real talk, right? <laughs> but there's no real talks online or anything. I thought like you know. No, like, no. no. <laughs> yeah. I don't like that guy, but I've I've never been in a fight. Anybody could punch me out. I just been down for a second. Uh, Taki does it all the time. Usually. When I <laughs> <laughs> it's my last, the last nail, nail away for you're taking a nap, buddy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, hey, you know, I don't want to cut you off, but there's a couple of questions and one that's kind of relating to what we're talking about. Uh, our good buddy Stunt Ken, hello, Stunt Ken, uh, says questions for all of us, uh, all three of us, in, or four of us if Taki sticks her head in. Prior to lockdown, as artists, you're not as affected by staying in and working. With the added element of staying in because of our circumstances, do you feel it has added more to your work creatively? Now, that's something we didn't really tune into. Does anybody, do you guys, any of you feel like you have more of a creative boost to get stuff done or a lightning bolt go off because you don't have to go travel like you used to? Anybody want to comment on that? Uh, like we don't travel anyway. So this is just a condensed, harder version of the way we we typically live, right? You wanna grab it? Hey, hey Taki. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, like we, we, right, we're just like locked. Like a lot of people think that this is kind of a blessing for, for creators, you know, because, you know, you get to be in more and, and all of that. I get it. But I think uh, only, only maybe, well, you work at home, but if you were going into an office and being yeah. creative in the office, then your 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 parameters are, are changed because now you have to do your creative work, but you're having to do it at home. Yeah, so well, I know some people that are like that. Yeah, yeah, and I would. And my my joke at the beginning of this was like, I can't wait this to be over so I can get out two or three times a month. <laughs> literally how much how often we would go out and without that since march it has definitely uh paid its toll you know um and with taki's ms we have uh, uh immunity issues and stuff so even like when i there's been a couple times i've gone to local parks and you see people it's just they're just filled with everybody who can't go anywhere else so they're all at the park and well i think outside is relatively safe still you know like i'm not too freaked out but it's just not worth taking the, the the chance of catching something so I can finally bring it home to yeah to me because yeah uh the MS itself it uh doesn't make me uh compromised but the treatment that I'm on uh makes me very uh immunocompromised so yeah I've literally been in the house since March 3rd um the only time I've stepped out was just to maybe take a walk um, which I haven't done too many of, um, or for the doctor's office. Yeah, and we have like exercise equipment and stuff here, but with the smoke, you can't even indoors. You can't use it to, to run or anything. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's so for the creative end, it's not been good either because no, I can draw, which is fine, but I can't. 
I have, I have really struggled writing, um, especially there's one book I've worked on for a while with Victor Santos, which is a conspiracy satire book. And when it's the world is no longer satire and conspiracy, but is led with conspiracies. And that I'm not, I don't believe that's a political statement at all. I think that's just, it's just fact. I mean, that's where we are now. So yeah. stuff that I was writing that was like crazy fringy is now like actually happening and affecting people's lives. So I'm like, ah, it's hard to write. Mm -hmm. Saki's got some comedy stuff she was working on and it's just like. Yeah, I just dropped it. I'm like, there's, I just, I can't. I, it's like pulling teeth right now. I just, it's. it's we, we, were, we were talking a little bit uh, a couple of podcasts ago because I think that's in a way what happened with things like Mad Magazine, which was way far out. And now the world kind of caught up to it and went past it. So what would seem far-fetched 10 years ago is like we're all we're way past was that back to future too with yeah yeah, yeah. now it just seemed like a cheap political statement and <laughs> yeah and mm -hmm. and I, I i saw something i think it was on twitter today where they say well climate change is coming and somebody was saying no climate change has already happened and mm -hmm. we're living we're actually living in the change. It's not like something that's going to come and we're still looking to see when it's coming. There's actually, we're right in the middle of it yeah. now. Yeah. So even with our job, which is creating fiction, like I said, the idea used to be like, you know, Blade Runner 2040. It was always like 50 years, 100 years away, there was going to be some, and it's like, no, we're actually yeah. living it. Right. Yeah. So how is that going to change? Will people want more fantasy fantasy? You know what I mean? Like not pandemic future. Mm. Yeah. Well, and, and it's not just like the, the weather stuff, but like because of all like the, the social upheaval. So even like materials that people want, you know, like it's a good thing right now that that powers is is kind of wrapped up in a way in this graphic novel because I don't I don't know how much people want to see if like cop dramas and you know cop fantasy stuff. I mean even television shows like Brooklyn Nine Nine, like they're not even gonna be cops anymore and stuff. And you can't pitch a TV show around police or journalism or science. Mm -hmm. Like those are things I was like literally told like yeah they, they, really no not even science I, you know We've we've not we've mocked facts, whether even even from our our side of just the fake you know that's fake news joke like like it ends up kind of permeating everything you know so like people's attitudes now when it comes to stuff like Bill Nye you know he used to be just an actor and he's not really a scientist and like forgetting right. what he's saying or now it's just this digging into things and stuff. I mean, whoever you were channeling in wasn't wrong. No, no, that's okay. <laughs> but that doesn't undercut the, the you know, the, the whole, actual science. Yeah, yeah. So it's like it's 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 also hard to create stuff now. Um, you have to kind of think about all that stuff that's attached to it, you know. Um, so I think everything I'm, everything is political. Everything is political. Whether you have black character in it, and then it doesn't have a black actor doing the voice, or you have a white character in it, then you can't get a black actor to do the white character. I mean, there's everything sure. now has all these other things and agendas attached to it. Right? And I like so, we're, we're having uh, these conversations where we are figuring these things out and stuff. You know, like I, I, I'm hoping all this turmoil we're going through is for a good outcome in the end. You know, and and that end might not be for another five or ten years. You know, we might still kind of be in the same for a while but you know you have to have to have these questions and and have these uncomfortable things happen to improve you know things don't just happen because everybody agrees well like even in comics i was saying to jamar the other day is like every day there's like another another moment of some, some outrage you know there's some some so yeah. even in even in 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 even in the mainstream so um uh, it's hard to find uh, an industry as an artist that is not being affected uh, in some way, political or financial. I mean, like your book, since you're doing your books yourself and yourself, you're, you've got these self-published or Kickstarter things I'm sure you want to do. 
I mean, this economic situation obviously affects what you think should be done next, right? What's going to fly? What's not going to fly? I'm going to spend a year on this. Am I going to get anything back? Or should I hold off on that and put this yeah. other thing up? And that's particularly tough for me because I have a habit of um, – it's a good habit, though, which is uh, if I want to do something, I just start it. So, like, yes. my book, The After Realm, like, I started on, like, 2000. 15, 14, something like that, and just built up pages as it goes along. Um, mm -hmm. I've got other projects like that too, where I've got just chunks of it done. Um, but then there is this problem where it's like now, like if, thank God I wasn't launching that, I don't know, whatever book that would be hard right now. Luckily, the creator on book I, I'm doing right now is uh, The After Realm, which is fantasy. So it's nice and easy, other than the fact that the market is saturated with fantasy books. Um, but uh, you know, sometimes you can prepare something ahead of time and then somebody else does a book very similarly. So there's a risk to that. Or, or like you said, the landscape right now is hard to tell. Like it's, it's hard to sell a book. Um, the retailers are, are suffering all of these issues that we're kind of dealing with and trying to figure out like the whole industry is upside down. And, uh, and in some ways it's good, you know? Well, I, I think everybody's suffering. Yeah. It's not just our industry, but everybody. So, you know, um, the economy is suffering and that's going to affect everything, right? So, it, you know, it doesn't matter if you have the right book at the right, with the right timing. If people don't have the means to get to it, then yeah. they don't, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, I know some people do web comics and they put the material up for free like uh the the guests we had a couple of weeks on the show and she, they keep the they'll, they'll keep the the uh the sponsorship low like a dollar or two and then they work and they build up and then uh they're able to make uh enough that they can they can get by i guess it also depends upon where you live because yeah. your overhead in a place like LA is going to be just like, or New York is just, it's here, right? If you're in Dubuque, Iowa, it's probably like here, right? So, I mean, does did that affect your reason for moving out west where you guys are now because of the? Uh, that, that was originally I got a job at uh, this company called Valve as a video game company, um, and it was just an opportunity that was too good to say no to. Um, so yeah, it just took a chance and jumped into the deep end um and then you yeah, know that's what brought us out here and then we liked it enough that we decided to stay even after he stopped working at Bell. that's very so, cool yeah we've been on the west coast for 13 years 12 years something like that something like that yeah a lot a, lot, a very long time yeah <laughs> for a decade do you yep. feel like West Coasters or do you still feel like East Coasters inside? I, well, I'm a Midwesterner. I'm from Minneapolis. So it works out. She's right in the middle. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but I definitely feel at home uh, on the West Coast now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, my jersey still comes out sometimes, but I've... Uh, I love I love the Northwest, other than the fires. Is that when you um, take, love, is that when you take your baseball bat out and go? This is my pocket space. You know, uh, <laughs> it's strange when it comes out, uh, mostly through suspicion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it took yeah. me years like to not get offended when people were like overly kind and nice and stuff. And people are good in Jersey. It's just it's just a different. Yeah, it's just different. It's a different thing. Oh, you have. You have that little thing like birds have, where they can tell we're magnetic north. Is when you're when you're from the from the west coast or east coast, or you're from Detroit. It's like when people are really nice, that little that little organ in your head starts itching, and you go, yeah. "Is this for I real?" Know how people cross the street, people who live on the west coast cross the street like there's no threat. Like they don't, yeah. A little bit of a run to your walk. Yeah. They don't turn their head. They don't like. Yeah. There's a lot of little bit <laughs> ways like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's a there's a Philly thing. I'm sure, uh, Mike, you've probably seen some of that when you were hanging out here, where a lot of people in Philly walk across the street across traffic 
and dare you to hit them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's like, that's the West Philly dare. Like the dude walking right in front of your and car. Looks right at you. Like right at yeah. you. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I got yeah. Obamacare. Go that's ahead. Like, hit the me. Body, the head doesn't move with the body. So, like, the body, you walk around and just. Yeah, it'll look right like <laughs> I dare you to hit me. And then they have that here too, except it's done with this like really stuck up, erudite, socially responsible um, speech that comes with it. You know, well, you know, sir, as a pedestrian, you know, and, ah, like, ah, you know, and then right. yeah, yeah, and then it'll hold up a sign, and then it'll pull out like the thing for you to sign, and your clipboard, and then some guy on a bike will come by, and then the pedestrian and the bike guy are yelling at each other because of who has the right of lane and. All of this stuff, and then they both hate the people in the car. And See, really I can tell you're a cartoonist right there. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was like a little mini comic right there. <laughs> yeah, the third act needed some help, but yeah. Hey guys, I, I want to get into your origin stories because I think that's always interesting for uh, the viewers and listeners to hear. Um, but I have a bunch of questions that are like towards the end of the thing, so I might just ask them out of order. One's for Taki. Taki, this is a production question. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Flowers at, from YouTube asks for Taki, what is your process for establishing a color palette for each new project? Oh. If you could do that without <laughs> having a computer in front of you, if you could uh, answer. My color process is here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I just literally go with my instincts. Like, I. I've seen other colorists who have established like, like um, you know, color palettes that they want to they want to use, color palettes that they they're drawn to. However, they do it. You know, they have this visual guide that they follow, and I don't have that. I just kind of wing it. She, she has this awesome thing where. You know when you're when you first start making comics, you don't know all the rules, right? So you yeah. have this bravery to do some crazy shit, and like she never colored comics before Murder Inc. You know we were gonna, I was gonna try to do it myself. We were looking at like like a lot of Steranko work and like looking at, I was looking at a lot of reprints of you know Toth and, and the guys that I loved, and it was all almost all flat colors. And I was like, these are through, why why are we so afraid of flat colors? Why are we so pushed away from it and then not just look at that flat co colors, but like look at like a great Jack Kirby page and like they're kind of monochromatic, you know, they're opposite colors, but like almost everything in the in the foreground would just be blue, mm -hmm. you know, and everything in the background is yellow and there's a little bit of color for the main superhero stuff. Um, so we started thinking along those lines and I was like, I can't do this and then talk because I just can't have the time to, to draw murder ink and color it like I thought that I could and talk's like, well, let me give it a shot. And then she, it's not that she's just doing like these wacky colors, but like the colors, you can explain that they all mean stuff. And, and yeah, that's... They, uh, they go by like the scene and like what the characters are feeling or what their intentions are. Like if they're, you know, uh, like if one character is like clearly lying to the other character and has sinister uh, intentions, then like the background will be like green and like the character will be like um, blue you know, mm -hmm. uh, something like that. Um, it, it always reflects like uh, either the uh, the emotion of the characters or just the mood of the whole scene. So it's not random. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, especially in um, Murder Inc., there's literally only two colors that I use per scene. And I use uh, the, let, let's, you know, your are there like red and green and then I'll just use different tones of red and green and that's all I like. I like it. <laughs> uh, yeah, because you know, I think a lot of people, I mean, I don't want to think people just assume you just go, ooh, I like, I like orange. Because yeah. right. there's always a, there's a method to everything. And you know, uh, especially if you, even if you don't really study color theory or how colors kind of bash against each other, I know one of my things uh, when I started coloring my own stuff or doing anything uh, professionally is my brain was rotted by graffiti. So um, like a lot of colors that just don't work together make sense to me. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, you know, like. You it's see, not good, right? Yeah. 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 Like, it, like it, it, you see it a lot more now, but like doing like a fuchsia 
in a baby blue next to each other. You would never see that in comics. I'm pretty. I, I hate to say this because many people get mad, but the 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 fuchsia, the, the combination of fuchsia and blue, mm -hmm. like it's going to be so incredibly dated. Like I see it everywhere. It's going to be the equivalent of like the 2007 star that was on everything, and then there was the skull. And 2010, that was on everything. And then 2013, 14 was the squid that's on everything. And then it became the antlers that was on everything. Yeah. The fuchsia color is going to be, I don't know what other, I guess it'd be like the, the 2000s, everything is blue look, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like all the films were just shot with a blue tint. You know, you can watch it, watch like Swordfish or something and be like, you know, after the Matrix, you just knew it was all there. It's okay. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. It's all right. <laughs> all right. So I, 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 think, I think that, um, you have people that that color that never studied color theory because they're coloring coloring emotionally, and I think that mm -hmm. that you it's it's like an instinct. Like people have perfect pitch or good rhythm for you know. I think it's the same thing. I think some people just naturally have it, yeah. and they can enhance it. And you have other people that you can teach all the theory about color and a tertiary color and all this stuff. And they will always pick weird or odd or colors that don't support because they follow rules. And sometimes rules are not emotional. And so there's yeah. that give and take. And I think yeah. somebody like Kirby, like you mentioned, his drawing wasn't about rules. It was about emotion and whatever mm -hmm. rules there were, were established whatever abstraction and everything he did was to establish the emotion yeah. of the story, the emotion of the characters. So you can't really color him in the same way that you would say Hal Foster, who's going yeah. for realism and you know mimicking natural lighting conditions and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, and I mean, even like. Uh, Mike Mignola stuff is very graphic, very flat, and Dave Stewart does those very subtle tones, which m match his work perfectly. Because if you really blew it out, then you would lose any of that odd poetry. Like Mike's yeah. stuff has a poetry to it, right? Mm -hmm. And so yeah. you have a poetry. You have a poetry, or Kirby has a poetry. So you want to find something that that rhymes with that with that poetry, you know, sometimes it's unexpected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm lucky both Taki. Well, it's not luck because there's obviously conscious choices, but, but Taki and Nick Filardi, who I work with all the time, um, they, they know how to enhance everything I do in very different ways. Um, and they're both storytellers in their own right. You know, um, they're both helping to tell a story with the color choices. And that's not always, like you said, that's not always a rule thing. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a feeling thing or, or an instinct thing. That's why I meant like, Taki didn't know the rules. Like she wasn't really a, a like she knows color theory, she'll dart school and all this stuff, but she had never tried to color in a comp before. And I think that was kind of the why it was so special, you know, and, and she like had this this instinct to be able to tell a story through these crazy colors. And then she reinvented it for Dick Tracy and then for After Realm, you know, doing different coloring styles. And she always keeps me guessing. <laughs> Well, you know, color, coloring has gone through a real revolution because we had the old school, hand done, everything was cut with screens, you know, people in the in the factories making all the hand separations. Then we got the computer and everybody kind of went crazy with the computer and like every effect on everything all the time. Just like in the 80s, you had the little lens flare. Any logo had a lens flare on it because like, well, once you have that, every every advertising executive says, well, where's the lens flare, right? Yeah. Right. When was the last time you saw a lens flare in, in a comic? Anytime recently? I mean, it can be done. I'm it's not totally like... totally going to use one right, right. now. <laughs> <laughs> no. I don't think it's... Really but, but now we've gone through, I think, a, a revolution in color where now we have uh, more subtlety and not always the extreme. I think the mainstream stuff is still often very extreme, like... Too much airbrushing and it competes with the inking so much for, for my taste. It yeah. competes with the drawing. It's not supportive. It's like it's just like, oh, you want sugar? Here's a hundred pounds of sugar. Here's yeah, this, yeah. You know? Um, but I do see 
so I kind of like that. A lot. Well, it, it depends yeah, on the, yeah, the artist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It depends on the art. But it's also right. there's there's and I think you guys. Well, I'm guessing you'll agree, but like because coloring has taken off into such this whole other level, um, artists can do a lot less. And unfortunately, a colorist are asked to do more. And, um, you know, I don't think they're being paid nearly as well as they should because they're they kind of surpass what inkers do. And I, I started out as an anchor. I have nothing but respect for, for inking. But what, what colors are asked to do now on like on these higher tier books it's it's just a whole other level game it's it's you're basically painting a book it's basically painting a book it's not just colors it's painting it's rendering it's you know it's 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 cutting the muscles and, and defining an anatomy and stuff and that is mind-blowing and i just uh i wish they could get more uh accolades more right. pay right. more recognition well, yeah more, definitely... and then you're usually still at the like the the shit end of the whip because you're the last person who has to make up all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, in the old days, nobody did anything like flatting. You just, you colored it and you wrote the little key on it. And then you, you know, yeah. somebody at the plant was actually trying to follow it. Hopefully, you know, well, yeah. um, but, uh, 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 so yeah, continue with your, the origin. Uh, yeah. So, uh, uh let me let me jump in here first because i know taki uh, i don't know you as well but we're familiar and but i know uh mike and i go a little little back a little further back and she if I, you do that's what he's trying to say <laughs> i don't want to get in the middle of any, <laughs> any uh marital issues here uh, so, but I know one thing that uh, I shared with you, Mike, is that your early, the early part of your career, when you were still breaking in and just kind of like making it all work, you had a really like shitty night watchman job. Right? Sure, yeah. <laughs> that that kind of allowed you to sit up all night and draw comics. Uh, was that kind of like the beginning of your entry point into comics? Were you doing some other things before you were doing the night job? Dude, I had a whole career that had peaked and crashed oh, in yeah. comics. That's right. That's right. That well, let's I, know get I, mentioned that. I like telling the story because there are a lot of people, obviously, they struggle, you know, yeah. with a day job and just getting the career done and stuff. And, um, you know, so, yeah, I mean, a short version is for before before powers and stuff. You know, I, I'd gotten to comics really early as an anchor. I was like 14 or something. Right. And yeah. a lot of independent work and that slowly built up. So like when I was like in my early 20s, I was working on Judge Dread for DC and uh Daredevil and a couple other things. And then the market crashed, you know, that, that mid-90s market crash was 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 tough. And, Companies went under, their jobs went under, stores went under, all that stuff. And I had to get like, and my son was born. So I had to get like this regular job to bring in regular money. And um, yeah, that was a security guard job. And I did that because I knew I could be up all night kind of drawing. Um, and Powers and Lace Templar and Hammer of the Gods were all created in like this phone booth, the security phone booth where we sat there and made comics and stuff. And you were wearing a cape. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was that kind of security guard. <laughs> it was actually, I was at, it was at like a car auction place. Nate is in New Jersey. I don't know if you ever passed by one of these giant car auction places. Mm -hmm. and, uh, truckers, truckers would come in all hyped up on cocaine and meth and stuff. And they're like unloading their, their, their truck. And I write down the, the numbers and then get back to drawing comics and stuff. And uh, Did you have to hide your work from other people that were showing up late? Like, yeah. you, like, did you like tuck it away when somebody showed up? When I say security guard, I mean security guard. Like, you know, there's just a bunch of, we're all just kind of washed out one way or the other. <laughs> you know, I mean, this just like all you needed to get the job was not to have like a federal offense on your right. record. <laughs> uh, I mean, literally, I had no prior work experience on paper before that. Like, mm -hmm. the only jobs I had up to that point. Uh, outside of comics, I like deliver pizza for a bit, and I wash some dishes. But like, I had not, I and didn't have, cape. and I wore cape. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, I had nothing when I went to, you know, that was, I mean, that was a scary thing too, is because I concentrated 
so much on art and comics. Um, there's no fallback plan for me at all. Mm. Uh, in fact, I called my art book when I find it, it called uh, No Plan B. B mm -hmm. because of that. Um, but that did scare me when, you know, the, the market had dried up and I was like, maybe I can't make a living as a comic book artist anymore. And that meant, you know, um, some low, low key, low paying jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was also a great time for me because it stripped away my ego. You know, this idea of like, I was drawing Judge Dredd and Foot Soldiers and some other stuff and, you know, flying to cons and being flown to stores and like the dream was coming true. And during this time period, I realized um, I don't need that to be a comic book artist, you know, mm -hmm. Maybe the internet and stuff. Like I knew, well, you know what? I could still just make comics for myself, you know, and get them out however I can. I don't know what the plan is, but like, I'm still drawing. I'm still an artist just because I got a full-time job. Well, it was a part-time job, but you know, it didn't, it, it wasn't this, this giant failure that I thought that it was. In fact, stepping back from everything, even my own art style, because I was drawing in a way to try and get attention from editors at Marvel and DC and trying to mm -hmm. guess what they wanted and stuff. That's when I stripped everything away and, and everything became simplified and, and I found myself through failure. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I did you, especially during that time, Oming, uh, now that you're kind of, you've been around for a while and you're still doing this nighttime job or part-time hustles, uh, what they call it now gig economy in 2020, but that was with you trying to keep your lights on <laughs> back in the 90s. Uh, did you kind of come up against any other creators who were like, wait, you have a day, you have a, a day job? Why don't you just quit that thing? Or did you have any, any other voices in your head trying to steer you in different directions? No, I mean, it, it was a time Oh, it's scary because it's it's similar to the kind of what's happening now, you know. Yeah. So like, no, nobody questioned it. I mean, they all knew like jobs were going away, companies were were folding. Like, I mean, like, you, you guys remember? I mean, I, and I know Mike was was there definitely because um, I, I think I first met you at cons where you were definitely like an established creator and stuff, and like the floor just kind of got pulled out from from everybody, you know. Um, so yeah, I mean. But ultimately, like I said, it was a good thing. Like I just, I realized I didn't need the things that I thought that I needed to be who who I want to be. You know? gotcha. um, and it serves me now. Like even when things get scary now, I'm like, you know what? I'll be fine. If I got to work at Starbucks or something like that and, and still make my own comics, as long as Tak and are together, we got a roof over our heads. It's all you need. <laughs> I mean, I saw it coming in the 90s. That's why I got out of comics and went into animation. Yeah, I saw I, I saw the I saw the, the the top of the peak and over the peak into the valley all within a couple of months right there. And and now I would say the main difference is then you still had distribution. Now, nobody really seems to know what the whole distribution thing is. It doesn't seem to be like, oh, this is the the path. Now there's all these different paths and do they line up do they not line up um there's yeah. like i said there's people we've talked to two people on the podcast who make a living both women doing comics and not anything that the mainstream audience or yeah i mean i think just earlier we we're listening to, to spike trotman's um interview um and God damn, she's amazing. Like mm -hmm. the fact that she's literally doing crowdfunding stuff before crowdfunding. Um, and she saw the landscape. Well, there's a lot. Of, I mean, it's funny. Like a lot of us older guys are now, and I hate to sound like this, like, oh, we're going to find hope in the youth, you know, but there's a lot of us established older guys who are learning new tricks from people who couldn't get in the way that we got in. And they mm -hmm. figured out how to break down their own doors to, to make their own path. And now it's funny, like we're the established guys and we're like looking at these young kids and we're like, oh yeah, I need to be more, I need to think like you, not think like the the, the industry that sustained my life up to this point. That's right. You need a TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> You're not the first person to say that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's just how it works now. And I think it's always interesting when we have, and I say this to Manly a lot, when we have different generations of cartoonists on the show, who have totally different uh, uh, backgrounds or who weren't influenced by the same guys 
Mike was influenced by, who may not even know who Manly is. I hope not. But let's just say there's plenty of people who have no idea who I am. Well, I mean, like just right, just to put that out there, I think it's interesting uh, that everybody can wind up at the same place with totally different genetic makeup, so to speak. Yeah, there's this like, and and it's is it's it's another great ego lesson, you know. Like for as much as I try not to be egotistical or full of ourselves or what we do, there's still some of that there on some level. Mm -hmm. And like as I started researching more about like who's doing things on their own right and i'm like looking at like these different youtube channels and stuff and i'll see this dude there's this guy um i believe his name is jason brubaker um and he has his, his art channel it's like him and his buddies drawing and and like when i first came across him i was oh this is just like a guy you know trying to get by or something and then i found out through like watching this he's this like huge animator he's incredibly talented he has a giant audience that like is just completely unknown to me like this whole other world and it's not just this dude, there's a lot of people like this, right? They've got, like, while they've not heard of us, we've not also heard of their world. <laughs> and like, we think, oh, if you're not as an established big name comic book creator, either in the mainstream comics or big, like a, like a Tilly Walden or Jaime Hernandez or something, that there is still this whole other giant world happening around us mm -hmm. that we're completely ignorant of. And yeah. I'm thankful for things like, like these channels and um, mm -hmm. that's what's great about social media. I, I would never, meet these other creators or find out about these other avenues or these other projects. Mm -hmm. uh, well, these are literally the reasons why, like, um, we decided to like, uh, figure out maybe Kickstarter and, you know, um, and like, not just look at like your floppies and, you know, mm -hmm. your traditional, yeah. Like we want to expand and find different types of audience out there because we know they're out there. And we have stories that we want to tell that are like, I can't imagine pitching this to a to, to <laughs> any company, like a, a known comic book company or even my own audience. You know, mm -hmm. like we're having this conversation about this comic strip that I did that's kind of kid oriented. And I realized my best bet is in an unknown audience because in comics, I'm known for crime and mythology stuff not funny, funny kid stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so I might as well just get a fresh audience because it'll just confuse the audience that I have now. And now with things like Kickstarter and Patreon and, and all these other ways of getting things out, it's great. Like even for an old dog like me, like, oh wow, look at this, There's fresh trails for me to go through and stuff and, and together and like, it's so, yeah, for all the crazy bad stuff, there's also a lot of great stuff like this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this had happened in like, 1980, everybody would have been totally screwed. <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah, we couldn't, we would not have been able to work at home. We wouldn't be able to do this. We wouldn't be able to do all this stuff. If this had even happened 10 years ago, yeah, it would have been way, mm -hmm. way, way we worse. All lost their minds and like, yeah, you know, I don't know, like just spread viruses around because it's just like, oh, forget it. Everybody be outside taking a mask off. Thanks, Obama. <laughs> COVID, would, COVID, COVID would be a lot harder with dial-up. <laughs> oh, here comes my COVID. A uh, ringtone. <laughs> Morning. <laughs> oh, you know, I, I, I like I, I mention all the time on the podcast. One of the one of the reasons I've been aware of the sea change is through teaching. Because teaching every year, you get a new re recruit, new group of young people who are interested in doing comics and animation. And the changeover in the last five years is very dramatic in what they like, how they, dis how they discover, how they consume. And it is really not at all like previous generations like as i'm always saying on the podcast mainly because of the cell phone because every kid i mean if you walk outside now and you go downtown they may not have their mask they <laughs> have their cell phone yeah right and yeah. i was gonna think all you would have to do to figure out what time uh what century i would say there's never been more people addicted to walking around how many people i've almost run over with my car in the yeah, last yeah. three or four years because they're walking with their cell phone like totally not 
yeah paying attention to what's what's happening and so that generation of people are coming in go through whatever path is natural for to them our natural path was to go to a store that had comic books in it yeah right. that's not a path that any of my students really care about in fact they told me last year like one of the girls said you know i like your work and everything but i'm not interested in reading about captain america or what that's just yeah, and that's not a bad thing. It's just things are different, um, and I, I've noticed the same thing. Um, so, so Bendis teaches, uh, Bendis and David Walker teaches at, at, at Portland State, and they always have me out to talk to their classes. And over the years, like I've seen the class change from like what you would expect to see in a college class, or what old guys like us would expect to see at a college class, is like half dudes and like uh, half girls, and that's really transformed. And it's like. It's like mostly it's mostly women in this class, um, a yeah. good handful of, of trans kids, um, and they're all reading. They all love the 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 medium of comics, but they don't want anything to do with what we recognize comics as. Yeah, so they want to make their comics either for the phone or the computer. They don't care about eleven by seventeen. They don't care about widescreen. They don't care about scrolling because it's all good to them. There's no sort of prejudgmental stuff. Except maybe the Marvel DC kind of, kind of vibe, because they're you know they're trailblazing a whole new vision um, that we're going to start following. Um, and again, it's amazing because whatever changes come to, to to the industry, it's not that comics are going away. It's just they're transforming, they're changing, and it's a process of that too. It's not just happening all at once. It's not like you know, hey, Mike and Jamar, here's the here's the layout for what comics going to be like now. It's like, or or not. Maybe it's more like expanding. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. like the traditional comics, I think it is going to stay. I don't think anything's going to change, and I think that's a good thing. But but I think it's expanding to different ways of doing comics, like digitally to just you know uh, on your tablet to uh, different ways of telling the story because it's on a on a, on a screen rather yeah. than a print and stuff like that. And it's just an expansion of what comics is yeah um like the infinite scroll thing was really interesting because we always love the sort of panel to panel moments of comics and um at first when i was doing some reading digital scroll stuff I, it's hard to find the right thing that really connects with me because of the storytelling aspects but you do find it and then i I've, I've done one which i haven't published or anything and i found the the the, the moment it's it's more about like a moment to moment feeling like literally, it's almost more storyboard. It's more about like the head turn and the and and the, those Will Eisner moments of the thing changing in the background, you know, as opposed to larger storytelling stuff like splash pages and mm -hmm. right. Yeah, uh, and it's interesting. It's it's crazy. It's like it's a different new language of comics that up until recently, every time you broke the format, it just didn't feel like comics anymore. Right, like, things start squiggling or moving or talking like that doesn't feel like a comic anymore. And like an infinite scroll was the first thing that really broke the spine of comics, but still feels like comics for, for me anyway. And it could be different for, for different people. But yeah, I, I also think that um, just going by, you know, the women in the class that I've taught, the women that I work with, they're interested in different kinds of stories too. Oh yeah. Right. And they're they're interested in a different pace of storytelling. Like everybody likes Harry Potter. And everybody, or many, many people like the action movies, but there, I would say the one of the things about, uh, and you're probably, I would think you would agree, when you're reading something like manga, you get a big wad of story to digest, right? And so there's a lot of faces, there's a lot of images of the face, there's a lot of the character talking. And for us, coming from that old world, you don't want to have a page where there's like nine panels of like people talking. That was like, no, no, no. Right. You have one page like that, and then everybody's kicking each other's ass, right? Or there's something blowing up. Right. Because that was part of the 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 style of the story that was most appreciated by also, they were used to reading stuff in black and white because they like uh, manga, which again was a thing that 
was like not cool in comics after a while. Yeah. Black and white. People didn't like black and white. I like black. The artists always like black and white. <laughs> the fans always wanted color. So it's very interesting to see the type of story. And it's a lot of romance, a lot of relationships. That's what they seem to be really interested in, also in the, exploring. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no. Um, one of the things that I love about the this sort of new newish diversity in comics is that diversity isn't just the people making the comics, but it's be, they're bringing in new ideas. It's the it's the diverse ideas because of these different backgrounds. Like you could take somebody who's not been a traditional superhero comic book person. And then they make a superhero story. They're going to bring fresh ideas into our sort of punchy, punchy, stabby, stabby world, right? Um, and that's one of the things that, that I've been loving most. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm reading all kinds of like when I do read comics, I'm reading a lot of like, Tilly Walden stuff. Like I, I never would have imagined that's that's what would have you know reading a comic book about somebody daydreaming about their life. That's that's like one of the, the books, and it's like this is fucking great. <laughs> you know, um, and you, you need those different ideas and different approaches. And then you mix that in with some traditional science fiction or traditional other genre stuff and you just get fresh takes on, 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 on new and old ideas. Um, I, I want to steer this in another direction, but Taki, I still want to hear how you got into the business because I don't know this story. So this will be interesting. But before, before we get to that, uh, Mike Hawthorne uh, wants you to know Oh, mean that you owe him money. Uh, <laughs> Venmo or Cash App, Mike Hawthorne, as soon as possible, please. Thank you. He always says that. He says it in a slight yelling voice. Can you owe me money? I can't quite hear like he does, but it's you can you can hear him yelling at you in the in the text. <laughs> uh, but also, well, uh, seriously though, but Mike uh, brings up a good uh, 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 question in the room that he spelled pretty. Poorly. <laughs> Someone asked Mike and Taki what it's like to work together. So I this is a question I've wanted to ask. <laughs> this is a question I've wanted to ask creative couples for a long time. And I've been trying to like maybe concoct, maybe we do a special couple, pencil to pencil or something. But tell me, tell us a, a little bit about the creative process when there's two creatives in the house. Like, do you do you guys work together? Do you have the same shifts? Do you kind of meet in the in the kitchen for 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 break room? Like Do you like hate each other's music. Yeah, like all those. <laughs> all, I think all those things are really interesting because generally most people who are partnered with somebody in our business has a totally different career than the cartoonist, right? It's like, oh well, my wife's a nurse or my husband's a lawyer, and you know they're totally like right brain, left brain type of things. But when both of you guys are sharing the same type of cre creative brain, how do you guys not get in each other's way or just maybe talk about? Or get on each other's nerves. I mean, well, you have those days where like, yeah. <laughs> it's really, really unfair uh, for us to talk about our process because I don't think we're like most people but we work really, really well together. Like mm -hmm. we share a studio. This is our studio that we like purposefully um, fit it so we can work together in the same room. Like we uh, broke down this one wall uh, between this uh, two bedrooms so we can work together. Um, we, uh, bounce ideas off of each other all the time. Uh, we talk about story structure and um, color theory and um, all of that constantly. Um, and when we work, uh, we usually put on like a podcast or sometimes we listen to music, but most of the times we like do like a, what do you call it? The, um, audiobooks and mm. that, and yeah. it's you know we've uh, we've done comics together like uh, Rapture and um, Synergy. Synergy. We've written that together, and even that was just seamless. Um, I would start a chapter, and then I'll just hand it to him. He'll break it down f further, and you know, we'll discuss it. And then there's just like no arguments. There's we generally 
agree with each other's like opinions like well this needs to be admitted because of this and this well yeah that makes sense and yeah just move on. And it just it's it's seamless almost and it's it's unfair yeah. and we have normal you know husband wife fights and get on each other's nerves about normal things somehow when it comes yes we do nah. yes we do <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, it's genetically impossible for me to turn a light off when I leave a room. <laughs> That's right. You're crazy. But when it comes to like, you know, uh, the minute at climax of a story or, or, you know, the dialogue or an idea, all the ego is stripped out. Um, and it's not something that we did on purpose. Uh, luckily, that just happened. Like, we didn't have to have a conversation about, like, let's not step on each other's toes and blah, blah, blah. It just, it was always very... Um, whatever the best idea as long as we can express our ideas like those this is as close as we come to like a bump is just trying to understand like if i don't quite understand well why would the character do this then it's a long conversation about why the character would do that and then maybe we just do what she what she suggested or through that conversation we find out something a different, really different direction or yeah yeah so we're, we're we are lucky that way it's pretty gross <laughs> And well, you, I mean, I think that's just probably a byproduct of both of your personalities, because I know artists where both can work in the same room, place like you guys, and others like each person needs their own sanctuary and they meet, but they don't, they don't, even if they collaborate, they, yeah. one person has their space and the other person has theirs. As their space. Yeah, I think the only thing is sometimes I need to listen to my my own music because some of my I, music for me is very motivational, uh, and some of the music I listen to is, is can be horrible. Some of it's not even music. There's like, I, I you know just weird shit. You know, I'm working on a um, a Jim Morrison story right now, and she's doing the colors on. Um, we'll talk about that in a little bit. It's really fun. But I'm just sitting there listening to a lot of like Jim Morrison poetry, mm -hmm. and I love my wife. So I won't subject her to hours of Jim Morrison's poetry, which I think is awesome, but it's just not for every, it's not going to motivate her. And I also like electronic music that can be highly repetitive. And like, that's the well, only I thing I have tinnitus too, so <laughs> it can, it, certain tones can hurt and stuff like that, so. Yeah, that's, that's our biggest bump creatively. Yeah. For my crappy mm. music. Mm. <laughs> so that, that, that is a wedge with some people. Yeah. Uh, they can't listen to, like I can listen to anything, um and but i and and so i've had many people share my studio over the years so i always figure like well you know they can listen to your stuff for a while they can listen to other stuff for a while um but some people are like are not like no i cannot listen to <laughs> you know what i mean it's just yeah. like nails on the chalkboard you know yeah. Yeah. so even when uh how often do you guys have separate projects you're working on independently from each other or are most of the things you guys are doing these days collaborative between each other a lot of overlap there's a lot of projects that like like mike was saying like uh even if there's no home for it yet like a publisher or anything like he'll work on a project and i'll be working on a project of my own mm -hmm. and they have nothing to do with each other um so like but we'll kind of work on those like incrementally like Whenever I have time, then I'll work on mine, and you know, vice versa. Mm -hmm. So we're always multitasking on projects. You know, like mm -hmm. I can't, I don't know offhand how many I'm working on right now, but it's it's more than a couple. And, and Taki's coloring some of those, and then she's working on more than a couple of her own. So yeah, it's just this constant turnover of of pages, ideas, and coloring, and frustration. <laughs> have, have you guys ever had an assistant or an intern or somebody? That you both can beat up, and, <laughs> and just a <our> dog. <laughs> uh, I I I hired a flatter couple of times, but it ended up being like uh, I, I'm I, I have such a partic like particular way of like working mm -hmm. that I felt like it was more work to hire somebody. Mm -hmm. Than to just do it on my own. I hear there's that, that, I hear there's that thing in the beginning sometimes when you have a to have a good assistant, there is that period at which it doesn't pay off because you're training that person. Yeah. That eventually it will pay off if it's the right person. Mm -hmm. um, and Are you flat any comics? Hmm? 
<laughs> is, that, is that your free ample too? Yes, yes, yes. I've been looking for a little flatting work lately. <laughs> we can't pay, but <laughs> oh, okay, good, good. I don't. I hate money. I can make you laugh. <laughs> <laughs> that's the exact thing I was looking for. I get I, I get paid in Nella wafers. That's what I take. <laughs> Those are all mine. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, I've got high cholesterol, so you know, that free ones, it's all mine. So Taki, how'd you get into the business? Um, well, I was I think 27, 26 to 27. I was going to this. I was I was working at an advertising agency, and I was going to an ad uh, ad school um, to become a uh, art director. Mm -hmm. And um, one day, a guy comes up and he's like, "You know, all you do is talk about comics. Perhaps advertising is it for you." And I'm like, "Hmm, yeah, I, I think you're right." I just uh, dropped out of uh, that school and I decided to pursue comics. That's that's the beginning. What kind of comics were you into? Well, right around that time was when I was introduced to like um, like American comics, right? So I like oh, I started off pretty hard, so I. Uh, uh, like I remember, like first few comics that I read were, were like Born Again, Daredevil, Born Again, and like Kingdom Come, and um, uh, what's that Batman story that I Year on? One? Oh, Year One! Oh my God! And you know stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's how I just I'm like, oh, this is good shit. <laughs> I like this, and uh, you can you can you can make a career out of this. And you know, I'm like, all right, well, I'm in. So, what were you reading before that? What had been your what you know, like when did you start reading comics? What what was uh, like in my time? like mid twenties? So you start. You didn't read comics before that at all. Not really. I mean, I so I grew up in Japan until I was ten years old. So I grew up in manga, um, and then in Minnesota, where I grew up. Um, well, one, I couldn't read English, so, you know. And then I didn't know anybody who read comics, really. So, um, no, I really didn't grow up with uh, comics at all. And in my early 20s is when I met uh, my then boyfriend, and he was heavily into comics. So that's how I kind of just sort of started reading comics from that uh, relationship and discovered that they're pretty awesome. So what kind of anime were you reading or manga were you reading as a kid? Um, Leiji Matsumoto stuff uh, comes to mind a lot. Um, Galaxy Express 999 was like a huge influence on me. Uh, Captain Harlock. Um, and then like, you know, your kitty stuff because I was, I was a tiny kid. Um, so like, Doraemon and um, uh, oh, the guy I can't remember. Um, oh, Gege Gege no Kitaro. Yeah. Um, it's, it's hard to remember. <laughs> Manga is everywhere. Everybody reads comics over there, and there's like a genre for every. Like, there's a comic for every genre. Like, mm -hmm. uh, for cooking, to tennis, to, you know, like, people who like to pick their nose. I don't know. That's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I've been to Japan a couple of times, and I, I the, the culture is so amazing. Like, I remember coming back and telling people, yeah, I was in the 7-Eleven, and they had the new One Piece manga on the counter. Like, that's just, everybody reads manga. It's a real thing, yeah. Yeah, you go to like um well you get into a cab, there's like manga sitting there for you. What in the cab? Like, <laughs> like user friendly ma than, manga? Yeah, rather than like magazines and stuff, or like you go to a doctor's office and in the waiting room, there's like manga there. Yeah. It's just everywhere. It's you don't question it. 
that also kind of reminds me a little bit about kind of like in Europe, how cartooning is celebrated a whole different way than it is in the States. Yeah. Um, you know, just like, you know, uh, cartoonists are still a high profile celebrated thing. Tauntaun. <laughs> I love Tauntaun. Tauntaun. <laughs> you know, I, we, we were in France a, a, like a couple, well, it's like 20, 10 years ago. And I think there was like a Hugo Pratt exhibit and they were like in the, in the subway in the tube, there are giant posters for it. It yeah. wasn't like in the back of the, of the, the news, the news weekly, you know, people really go to that stuff and really love it. So uh, yeah. it's a different culture. Yeah. Be nice to get that here. <laughs> it, it could happen. Yeah. Um, it could happen. I mean, that's what I mean by like uh, the, the comics expanding. Yeah. That, um, yeah, I think the younger generation definitely is figuring out that like you don't have to just have this one or two genre mm -hmm. to succeed in comics. Um, there's just, there's more people on earth now than there ever was there like you know your audience ship is limitless so well, i think all because of the, the the internet now i mean that didn't exist for us when we started out so you could only reach a few thousand people in america right unless yeah. you work for marvel or dc right and then you're reaching you're reaching a hundred thousand people, a hundred, two hundred thousand people, right? Now yeah. you can literally put your thing on Instagram and anybody with a cell phone can see it. Yeah. Right. You know, and so that changes the whole dynamic, also because I think people don't feel the young creators to me seem not to feel constricted by genre or uh and even a, even fa a fan base's expectation, it will it will fall upon you once you're successful, because then your fan base has an expectation of you as a creator, and they want you to satisfy their 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 Jones. You know, it's like uh, you know you read all the the fallout about uh, J.K. Rowling now, you know, and her political opinions and riling up all the kids that grew up reading Harry Potter now and like their minds are are melting because they have this love of the yeah. of those characters but they're obviously having some of them are having big disagreements with the creator and so uh, I can see that kind of thing happening with the future of comics if it can reach that kind of global because we still haven't except for the like Snoopy or Peanuts or something. I, we're still in the, I think, beginning stages of having you could create something that could appeal to readers globally because mm -hmm. of the new, because of the fact that there is not this restriction of platform like there used to be. Like if you printed something in America, maybe got to England, a few places in France, you know what I mean? A couple places in Spain. But it was not, or it would have to be reprinted. They're like, they reprinted Powers where? And, and have they reprinted in Spain? Have they yeah. reprinted in Italy? Yeah, I think in all the, the major European countries it's been around. So were you, so were you getting feedback from readers yeah, over there? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's really awesome, you know, hearing from people in, in Europe and, and, you know, who's reading it in a different language and still kind of getting what we're going for and stuff. Um, and hopefully, you know, I think comics can get a larger acceptance through um, what's happened now with the internet, but also, you know, the graphic novel scene, the the adult graphic novel market, while not as big as we want it to be, will hopefully keep growing. You know, books like the the, the um, John Lewis book um, is uh, helping to spread the word and stuff. And the more we can see, a, you know, adaptions of novels and stuff like that. I think it's it's going to help spread comics into the mainstream a little bit more. And especially, if, you know, we find ways to get them into people's hands. So so you started out reading American graphic novels, right? You were not reading the floppies. You were reading the collections of, of like, mm -hmm. Dark Knight. Yeah, you. Uh, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so uh -huh. your experience of reading it was even different than the average kid because you were reading the whole collection at one time. 
Right. Like um, a lot of the storylines that I was reading uh, were already completed mm -hmm. by the time I got to them. So, yeah, they were, well, my ex-boyfriend, you know, he was a huge collector. So I think I actually did read them in floppies, <laughs> but, oh, okay. uh, but they, they were already like done. The storyline definitely mm -hmm. done. And, um, and after we uh, we split up, I continued to uh, read comics, and I remember like uh, going to a comic shop by myself, and I'm like, I don't, I don't know what what to get, but I want to continue to read. So I just kind of started on my own, which was which was quite daunting at the time. But yeah, I, but <laughs> I think that's one interesting thing about comics as a hobby is if you've ever taken somebody to a comic shop or been in the shop with somebody wanders in and goes, so where do I start? Yeah. You know, it's just kind of like, it's a really hard question to answer for a shop owner. Cause it, it, especially American comics is not really set up that there's a number one that leads <laughs> directly into 50 yeah. volumes of something. Yeah. You, know, you just gotta go, oh, well you might like this storyline. Yeah. Also, also I think that the, what, the other thing is that unlike a, a real bookstore, comic book stores very often, especially back in the day, did not encourage you to read or browse, like stand around and like, oh, I'm going to take a bunch of these over here and look at them. Yeah. And then I'll buy these. That's what I like. You know, it was like, no, keep it in the bag. Keep it, keep the little piece of tape down on it. Keep it moving. Yeah. You know, now were you, yeah. yeah so, so Taki, were you, were you, Drawing at the same time, were you interested in drawing comics when you were reading the did that? Yeah, um, so I've been an uh, artist all my life, um, and that's why I was going to uh, ad school is uh, because it's the, the most artistic way that I knew to earn a living. So you know, I was like, well. Because I, uh, I I grew up with this mindset of like I'm I'm never gonna make a living being an artist. Um, you know, it will always be something that was just in me and a, a hobby. Um, so um, so yeah, so I've always been an artist um, all my life. So yeah, uh, it, naturally I was drawn to the comp the comics because of the art and now I'm absolutely in love with like the writing uh, uh, aspect of it and drawing aspect of it and now coloring too. So are you trying to do your own stories? As well, what? Were you trying to do like your own write and do your own stories and and and, and you know because yeah. I mean I know Mike's history a little bit and like how I'm sort of interesting how you were trying to learn the craft because it's like when you start wanting to draw and then you want to start getting serious. And then I'm, what I'm always interested in is how everyone begins to say, well, I need to learn to draw better. What are, what's that process like for some people? It's like, Oh, I read an interview and they said, by the Will Eisner thing, or I read this and said, look at that. So what was your, your process of, of training? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I guess, like I said, I, I've, I've been an artist all my life, but I've always done more realism. So I had to learn how to do more line work. And that was a really weird uh, switch that that I had to uh, you know um, switch over. Um, that was a, a it tripped me up. Um, yeah, when I met her, she was a uh, her job was she was a, a life drawing artist at uh, Mall of America. Like you know she do portraits and stuff, and it was all charcoal. Mm. Uh, and I remember you telling me was it Josh Metters teaching you about inking? Like when you were, you were first, you're, her her I I think to address your question, like her her transition was like from sort of like fine arts of you know, painting and charcoal, and then talking with Josh about like, well, how do you define these lines? And, and yeah, and also like um, at that time, like um, you know, there were distinct like pencilers and inkers. Uh, so I was just concentrating on becoming a, a, a penciler. Mm -hmm. uh, and then yeah, I met a, a 
a, a comic artist and he's just like you should learn how to ink it's really easy it's really satisfying and it, it it'll just bring you to the next level and you'll understand this craft better and i'm like I don't know, man, <laughs> but I did it, and I'm so glad mm -hmm. to do that. How are you guys doing for time? And we've already been talking for an hour and thirty minutes. I don't know where the time goes. You guys all right? You feeling a little wiggly? We're in a pandemic, and we're stuck in here, so you know. <laughs> and please, don't please don't leave. Please don't leave. I don't want to hold you. I don't want to hold you Let's hostage. Try to answer some questions, and we'll try to keep them relatively short so that we can get. To them and stuff because I think every time somebody asks a question, we go to a long ramble about <laughs> oh, no. topics. It's, it's all good. It's all good. Um, here's one, and there's a couple more for both of you, Taki and Omi. Uh, Stunt Ken, Stunt Ken is the MVP of our chat tonight. He's asking a lot of dope questions. So he goes, "I read a Twitter post of a new generation artist rant how he feels it's bad to draw actual physical comic pages and that artist depends." on selling originals later for the additional income. Do you feel there's still a relevance in original physical comic page art and its importance over strictly digital? And I guess meaning just to break that question down a little bit more is, do you still feel a need to have original pages or is dr drawing digitally just more, does that more of your workflow? But how do you guys approach that? I think it's safe to say for, for both of us that we're about the finished project product about, you know, what's being printed in the book. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I, I sell art, but, um, I've never been one to, to sell art to, to such an extent that it's a giant part of my income. Mm -hmm. Um, part of that was I just always undersold it. Like I was always, I was like a pre-socialist or something. I was like, I want the art for the people. So $10 or some ridiculous. Mm -hmm. stuff. <laughs> like I really just undersold myself for years. Um, but and then and today it's just about getting the finished product. So I I will go back and forth. There's some of my pages that are like 20% digital and 20% analog. Sometimes I'm just sick of drawing at the desk, so I I got to work on the computer. Well, that's 20%, yeah. 20%, 20%, what was it? 60%. Bullshit. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So like yeah, we just I mean Taki's all di digital. I but my I, my uh, my going all digital is only because I have. Physical limitations um, from mm -hmm. you know just the my the disease uh, robbing me of time and you know uh, efficiency. Yeah. And uh, I you know I have um, they call it MS uh, fatigue. Um, I I I don't have the energy. Energy. <laughs> yeah. Or even the mental capacity apparently to. Um, <laughs> Worm as a person of my age, um, so I just you know like so if, if I, I the the I love drawing physically like that action is so satisfying, but um, you know having to draw something physically and then um, scanning that in and then going to your computer desk and then like fix whatever needs to be fixed and digitize it and make it, you know, prettier, or whatever. Uh, that going back and forth is, is just too much for me. Uh, so I I figured I have to go all digital. It helps my eyes too, now that I'm older. Like it's just hard, you know, 20 something years of staring at a page as close as, as, as taking a toll, you know. But mm -hmm. to answer your question, if any anybody is telling you or anybody else that digital or original art is more important than digital art or something. They're, they're just concentrating on the completely wrong thing. Right. Yeah. It's I mean, not even a conversation to be had. Yeah. It's I mean, just, I, I think it just is that the, the answers are different for each person. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to jump uh, uh, around a little bit. This is from our good buddy, J. Robert Deans. JRD asks, uh, this is for Oming. I remember finding your art in a series of monster parodies aimed at a specific audience early in the 90s. <laughs> How did those inform your early career and get you work with the larger companies later on? How did my pornography work get me work at the later 
at the larger companies. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, what's he, what's he, I think, uh, well, what's he talking about here, Bowman? Yeah, um, back in the early 90s, part of my, my breaking in and cutting my teeth in comics was in porn parodies. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to remember back then, again, there was, there was no internet. There was no way to promote your work. Like unless you wrote to every single store, somehow got the address for every single store. Like there was, if you were doing indie comics, it was, it was financially dangerous. Because first of all, you needed about $1,500 to print your book in black and white. That's mm -hmm. before you know if you can even print it. Mm -hmm. Meaning before you even solicit it, you have to have that money in your pocket ready to print. And then you might find out that you don't have enough to, to, to enough orders to even print your book. You know, even if, even with the three and four different distributors at the time. So one of the easiest ways was to just do parodies and porn parodies was a big part of that. And uh, Comic Zone, we did all these like goofy, uh, there's Dr. Hooters, um, <laughs> Night of the Giving Head. Um, <laughs> Moby Dick, we didn't even have to change the title. Right. Um, <laughs> it itself, right. Yeah, I so think, it was a lot of that. It would still sell today. Mm -hmm. It would still sell yeah, today. Moby Dick is evergreen. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds like a whole title itself. Moby Dick is evergreen. Well, I, I remember those times because I remember when I started to self-publish, I got the phone numbers of hundreds of retailers, and I called them individually. And there was two type of retailers: the kind that go, "You're not doing Wolverine, I ain't buying it," right? And, and then the other person who was like one out of twenty would buy your comic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Andy you knew how hard it was, how financially yeah. risky, and like, yeah. and it was, it was, it was like throwing away your life if you want to self-publish back then, you know, and be successful. Mm -hmm. um, it was almost that bad. So yeah, doing doing like parody comics, and that's why also you, you would have seen a lot of like rock and roll comics, you know, biography comics and stuff. I did a bunch of those as well. And um, what was great about that too is it was a lot of um, we'd have to wait till we got the orders to even go into production. Because why start drawing it if it might not get enough orders? So I had to learn to draw fast. That's where how I learned to draw fast. That whole you know, is that theory about like taking your time to make the perfect pot, or you make like twenty pots like really quickly. Eventually, the person making twenty pots really quickly and sloppily is going to have a chances are going to have a better. Well, except for the money shot, you have to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it was an easy way to to make your comics and stuff. <laughs> money shots. <laughs> And even to that, I mean, and, and sex always sells. Like, if you look at some of the biggest Kickstarter stuff, it's girls barely dressed. What what saved the internet sure. from dying was pornography. When mm -hmm. the internet imploded the first time, all the technology, this, what we're on right now, happened because of pornography. Mm -hmm. People want to see naked people so bad that they <laughs> have to create technology, and they're willing to pay to use that technology, to compress bandwidth, all this Oh, okay, Mike. No. <laughs> but uh, but I re I remember that time. You're right. You would you would get your orders. You'd print, but you still wouldn't know what you would sell. You wouldn't know what your sell through was. Mm -hmm. And then you were thinking three months down the road before you really knew what your real numbers were. So you might literally have to even for a small press person tie up ten thousand dollars worth of income. To, to print three, yeah. four, five issues of something, only to find out maybe by the fifth or the sixth issue, it starts to sell because some ass can put it up on the wall in a shop for $70 because the first issues are hard to find because they were they were low orders. I mean, that was like a common story. And I always run into people who go, you know what, I'd really be into indie books if an indie person could stick with it long enough to have uh, 25 issues of something. But you just, right there, it's just almost like even like hip hop in the early 80s, if a rap group had more than two albums, they were legends. You know, yeah. Like you, you got in once and that was all you were gonna get. You know what I mean? So longevity in that marketplace, especially in the, uh, the mid 90s and the early 90s was tough. Want to self-publish? I totally so, agree. So now, how did you two meet and then decide to like? Do you meet and decide to work together, or did you meet just socially 
And then immediately we knew we, I, I wouldn't say we knew we were going to work together, but like a, as our relationship built, it just seemed natural to try it out first. And then it wasn't a disaster at all. It was pretty awesome. So, you know, so and it was the hardest times of our, of our lives really at, the, at that time. And what was the, what was the first, what was the first uh, project and how did you guys go about doing, would you like secretly put the work on the other person's desk and then see what happens? <laughs> so our first project together was Rapture. Rapture. Yeah. Yeah. So that was through Dark Horse, and that was what year was that? Do you remember? Two thousand ten, nine, stuff like that. Seven, eight. I don't know. It's hard to tell. Back then. <laughs> but I, I mean, it, it came across. Oh, Sorry, it, yeah. so like, yeah, it just kind of came out of like, uh, like I said, we all we talk about story and story structure and ideas constantly. That's that's our porn. So, you know, like I, uh, I'll have an idea and be like, well, I have this idea and you're, you know, I'll expand on it or it'll be the same. And then, uh, we'll talk about it to death. And, uh, one of the stories that we talked about was Rapture and we pitched it and got picked up by Dark Horse. And that's, um, and yeah. I was like, well, this could end our relationship or <laughs> we'll, we'll figure it out. But so. I think it all came, it came, came up about, because um, our, our relationship is long distance. Mm -hmm. I was in New Jersey, she was in Minneapolis. So our relationship was built on um, speaking, on conversation. Oh, okay. Um, so that may, I think that informed the writing end of it too, because we had to learn to, to really, really communicate. And listen. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of Rapture was kind of made up from our experiences. Like we're at the airport a lot. So the story begins in the airport. Um, we had both been through breakups, like harsh breakups in the past. So like that was an element of the story and how a breakup feels like the end of the world. So it's mm -hmm. two lovers break up at an airport, the end of the world literally happens and then they try to get back together and stuff. And that just, it, part of that came out of driving her from Minneapolis to New Jersey when we moved, did a lot of talking, you know, on, on the ride and stuff. So yeah, that's sort of how it, it evolved. Yeah. That's super cool. Uh, I wanted to jump, well, we're all over the place in this <laughs> interview. I want to talk about powers for a second, sure. uh, and then maybe a little bit about your relationship with uh, with Marvel and jumping back and forth into independent work. Um, so, I remember when powers first started coming out; it was everywhere. In my one one of the comic shops in Philly, it seemed like every time I went in, there was another two issues of powers out, and I think quickly. Uh, Mike, your name got around as somebody who is is legit, right? There's a lot of indie guys who we know who've kind of come up the ladder and then they kind of disappeared, but you've always been a mainstay in it. And obviously everybody knows Bendis' career and uh, your relationship with each other with Powers is always kind of like around. Like Powers is like a, a really big part of comics that I don't think really gets its due. If I could get, if I could just shine some 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 sunshine on you for a second, yeah, right. And then, uh, well, I kind of wanted to talk about how when Powers was kind of you guys doing it, and then it went to Marvel, and then it wasn't at Marvel, and then you're doing the thing at all of that. How did all that was all that just mainly distribution, or why did you guys keep jumping the series around? Um, I mean, a lot of that just to do with um, Brian's career. You know, mm -hmm. like when we when we started Powers, um, Brian had barely started working for Marvel. You know, so we were just scot free to do whatever we want, wherever we want it, and stuff. And then Powers blew up. Brian's career blew up and became much more valuable to Marvel. Um, and they made us an offer. They were like, "We'd like to keep all of your work here, grab mm -hmm. Mike and some other people, and do your stuff here." Because it was an image before. Yeah, right. yeah. So we began we began an image. Had a great run there. They treated us great and stuff. But you yeah, had this other opportunity. It seemed kind of crazy. It was like, we're going to take this independent, dirty cop book and publish it at Marvel. And, you know, um, mm -hmm. so that's, that's what happened. It was great. We had a great working relationship with them for a long time. Those are some of the most fun, creative years. Um, that's also when I started doing a little bit of work at Marvel, some writing and stuff, and a little bit of drawing. And so it's fun, like being in New Jersey, I could get to New York really easy and kind of hang out at the Marvel offices, and mm -hmm. talk to people and hang out. And all that stuff was fun. Um, and then the, sort of the same thing happened with with DC. You know, when Marvel, when Brian's time at, at, at Marvel was done, he's 
making his move to, to DC, Brian looks out for his little brother and all that stuff. So mm. make sure that I had a home and his other books had a home there. And um, that's where we are. So, uh, yeah. Did you, you follow was that, was, that the, was that the Marvel Knights era? Yeah, but we we're never part of Marvel Knights. I think we kind of, by the time we got to Marvel, I, I think Marvel Knights was winding down, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. But yeah. that, that whole Marvel Knights attitude was part of what got us there. You know, it was, you know, Kassad and a handful of other people just had a, a, a this vision of giving creators real control again. Um, mm -hmm. That revitalized everything, brought in fresh talent. And that's kind of how that happened. And yeah, you got to like follow opportunity where it shows up, you know? Yeah. So can you talk about the TV show for a sure. minute? Um, I mean, we had a pilot at FX that that was amazing to, to happen. Well, first, our very first deal of powers happened almost out of the gate. Like in 2000, 2000 or 2001, we got a, a deal with Sony. And there was a lot of development that went into it. So by the time the television show happened, it's good that it dragged out because it wasn't like, oh, my God, oh, my God, we've got a TV show. And like it was just this slow build up to this thing. And, and it made it palatable and, and, and easier to deal with, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and it was still amazing to watch it all put together. The first pilot didn't quite work out, um, but it looked amazing. It had this really cool cast. Um, it looked great. It just didn't quite come together, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but Sony continued to believe in us, and they brought us over to – this is the beginning of all the streaming stuff. So we had two seasons on Sony PlayStation. Um, and they were – half of the studio was really looking to create fresh streaming material, and the other half didn't want to. So mm -hmm. it was this kind of um, little bumping of the heads and messaging and stuff. So we had good ratings. We had a, we had a, we had a good rating team and stuff. We had a great cast. Who were still in touch with most of them. Um, some of them even have come out to spend time with us to just get away from LA and stuff. Yeah. And that was really cool. Yeah. And like made great relationships out of it. Two amazing seasons. Uh, the third really would have gotten powers fully into its vision. You know, the mm -hmm. first season was very much about like let's let the show be itself and find its own feet. Second season got much closer to um, sort of our original spine and taking what worked of the first season. Um, and that's you know, we had two great seasons, and uh, very grateful for that. One of my um, things that I pick at a lot on the show is that we talk to a lot of cartoonists who have wound up either by force or because of uh, divine intervention in Hollywood in some way, right? And the thing always comes up about how things get stuck in development hell all the time or it's almost a running thing with manly and i like whose thing was held up the longest you know what i mean like was it andy park's thing was like 12 years or something like that yeah you know it's and typical i mean yeah right it's just typical of how this stuff works but i think on the fan side of it um and i kind of battle with this you guys a little bit is i still feel like to a lot of fans that movies and television is the ultimate form of entertainment. So mm -hmm. even both of you as cartoonists of letters, uh, should they, I guess, I think people think that that is what you're striving for is another TV show or another movie. So, well, you know, since you, you've been there, the like you talk about that, yeah. You know. I mean, we want those things and, and I'll be honest with you, like really, a lot of that is just, it's it's about securing your future, you know? Well, and also, again, it's expanding your audience ship. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's one of the reasons why uh, cartoonists uh, strive for TV show or movie. It's not just for the money. I think it's for this new gamut of like viewership who would have may maybe never have heard of, about your comics or Right. Will never read a comic ever, but at least they'll get to know your material through this medium that is pretty universal. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and you know, by expanding your audience, it gives you more creative freedom. That's that's the hope, right? Is mm -hmm. that um, well, at least for, for I think for all of us, all four of us, we 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 have multiple ideas. You know, we 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 have multiple different projects and mm -hmm. stuff that I know that neither of us, any of us, will ever really probably get to all of them, right? You're so right. like 
show or a movie or something. It affords you the ability to do it. Like, look at what Kirkman's doing. You know, he's he he could just not do comics anymore if he wants. But you know, no matter how many shows he's got, like he's turning it back into to making more creator own books. Um, work with artists that he wants to work with. Uh, work with concepts he wants to do and stuff. And you know, it's 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 more that larger picture. And and part of it is yeah something that plan for in the future you know um so we always talk about like well you know if we won the lottery or something like yeah. what would we do like it's not like we're gonna like go buy a helicopter and like run off into the sunset <laughs> what, what? <laughs> i thought that was the plan everybody there's no helicopter the sun and you just fly <laughs> right into the sun stick to the plan <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like we just we we're like yeah we'll just like we'll just make comics exactly the way we want and without worrying about like how do we you know um, where do we publish it through or whatever like there's no, no worry right so like we'll just yeah do our comics and like and that 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 that's the security that we we I I think a lot of creators want yeah yeah I can't speak for everybody but you know. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah and you funny. can't get too distracted by. It. Yeah, I was thinking uh, the other day. It was you know we all have our little Ralph Phillips sitting there, and you start to have your imagination. And I was thinking, boy, if I won, you know, like one of those mega million lotteries, what would I do with the money? You know, I probably give at least half out of of it away to people and stuff. But then Jamar I would Nicholas. take I would take some of that. Uh, <laughs> right, Jamar Nicholas. Would Jamar Nicholas. He would get that dollar. That's owned, he would get the dollar that's owned to buy Hawthorne. But uh, um, I was thinking, I would probably give. I would probably make comics with people that I really liked. I would do. I would just because then you then it would just all be totally about creativity. You wouldn't have to worry about the. I mean, you want to make the profit, but it's not like you know. Yeah. Yeah, and then I would take all the profit. I would, I would also love to be able to just get off social media because I would have to promote. <laughs> well, you could have you could have a person who was just on social media for you. See, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. and then the rest of the time you could take remote control helicopters full of money and fly them into the sun. There you go. <laughs> well, Mike, I, I know you have uh, you're promoting your. your <laughs> Your new power is a graphic novel, right? Isn't that the newest thing that's going on with you? Oh, they're breaking up. Damn it. Can you guys hear me? Uh, you're breaking up a little bit. What did yeah. you say there? Oh, uh, I was giving you guys a chance to play the new, power, the new Powers book. Uh, oh, yeah. I should have grabbed it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, well, yeah. So the <laughs> the new uh, don't worry about it. Yeah, the new the new powers um, book is a graphic novel. yeah, it's a, it's a graphic novel um, that celebrates the twenty years of, of powers or so. Um, and it's I don't want to call it the end of powers, but like if there was a last power story, this this could be it. You know, it calls mm -hmm. back on a lot of the history. But you could also read it. Brian worked really hard to write it in such a way that you could read it without having ever read Powers before. So mm -hmm. it's sort of perfect if you ever want to try out Powers. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also great for obviously for people who read it from the beginning. Um, Brian worked really hard to make it like a fresh read, mm -hmm. and he pulled it off somehow. It's, it's somehow simultaneously something that has all this history behind it, but something that somebody fresh can read. And it's like 260 something pages. We kept making it bigger. There's a ton of extras in the back, a ton of photos. I wrote a very long sort of editorial about my history with powers and um, a lot of photos from the TV shows, um, behind the scenes stuff. And um, it takes place literally 20 years after the very first issue of powers. So mm -hmm. we also aged up the characters, which was a lot of fun to draw like an older Walker and older, slightly heavier Dina. Um, yeah. And didn't it literally, uh, get public or yeah uh was available the exact same month as a uh, 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 20 year anniversary yeah 20, uh yeah uh from the first issue yeah, yeah. So, supposedly it came out yeah it did, it's september of of uh 2000 
So oh, yeah, wow. great. Yeah. That's cool how that all lines up. That's really cool. Yeah. And the only comic <laughs> I ever teared up drawing. But it makes sense, you know. You're crying. You're crying while you drew it. You're crying but I, like huh. But I cry all the time for other reasons, not because yeah. of the comic. <laughs> Hey, um, Manly has some art he wants to share. Mike, you want to lead us in on this? Okay, so I, uh, when we said the mic was going to be on, I went and found uh, there was a couple job. There was a job we did uh, back in the day, which was a lot of fun. Um, so, oh my God, yeah, it's our Catwoman story. Yep, a Catwoman story from two thousand. Three. three yeah wow. yeah yeah and then mike actually drew me as one of the <laughs> the people in the in the in the uh in the story there oh, you oh. you might be you might be the only person who's thanked me before really at least in a published book um um i don't think anybody else has ever <laughs> thanked me before Wow. And you did a great job. I mean, you understood why I was laying down black and compositions and yeah, that oh, was, it was, it was a lot. Of, it was a lot of fun. That's and awesome, here's man. A, and here's another page. <laughs> I was a lot more cartoony back then. It's just something that I kind of struggle with now, like figuring out how a cartoony to get or not get, you know. Um, here's an here's another page. Oh, uh, that's awesome. Yeah. I love that. When what yeah. when was this? What year was this? Two thousand three two or three somewhere somewhere in that in that area they collected it in um uh an issue of yeah. a, a re, dc put a reprint out um, dude this is awesome i totally forgot about this really I, I, I gotta look at the pages again yeah yeah i think i That's still I, 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 yeah mainly did nice <laughs> no th thanks wow. it was it was a it was cool. a it was a lot of uh, it was a lot of fun, and uh, that was actually when they were still lettering on the board. That shows you how far back it was. Wow! So the the, the well, that was, was actually 2003? yeah two thousand three. I don't know exactly where in there they transitioned because there was a while where they were still lettering on the board. Then they went to lettering what? on layouts and pasting that down, yeah. and then they went to uh just everything being digital and this would have been like, like the last time that I, that I had physical art that I would have to like mail out do you remember actually having to FedEx this into the I, I would have had to for you to have the originals and for the for the the, the, the letter to letter on the board right yeah yeah like I, I don't, don't remember think we, don't... We're, like, like I don't think I sent you like digital pages and stuff. Well, yeah, I mean, if you were able to send it digitally, then it would have been a letter. I, I like that she kicked his arms off of him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, and it's funny because you mentioned something. You, you mentioned something about um, how cartoony to be, and that's really only a conversation or a subject. Uh, topic, I should say, that you talk about in mainstream comics because outside of what I call the walled city of the baby men, nobody talks about that. Nobody in the newspaper strips talks about that. Nobody in, in uh, you see people uh, publishing things online. I never read about that, but in the mainstream, you know, the, the direct market, I used to talk to Mike uh, Mike Raringo about that all the time. There was a lot of like, well, you know, well, we like your work, but um, you know, uh, it would be better if uh, you weren't as uh, cartoony. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I and I think that that yeah, and and uh, it's funny because my original samples that landed me work work very super cartoony stuff like Bigfoot you know, like an anthropomorphic animal stuff. And I always liked cartoony stuff and, you know, you know, Neil Adams. And I never thought that one had to be better than the other. But it's funny that you say that because there was definitely a time in the mainstream 
I mean, people used to knock Mignola when he did that issue of, of cable. People like, yeah. right? People are like, gonna, you yeah, know, it's the whole the video. are going to fly off their heads and they're going to, yeah, yeah. So it's just, it's very odd because I think maybe we're finally passing that time because now there's all kinds of styles existing at one point, but there really was a time where that was an issue. Like, Fans didn't like the cartoony mm -hmm. stuff. Yep. Like they'd feel insulted. Like, well, you yeah. know. And now they're, they're yeah. How dare you? <laughs> so, how would you say your style has evolved? <laughs> what would you say your in which what what ways would you say your style has evolved over that course of this, those twenty years? I don't know. Maybe it's just more refined. Um, I, I think I'm kind of doing the same sort of stuff, but I've been refining it. It's kind of the best way I, I, I can I can put it. Um, I think I've become a lot more. I've learned I've learned how to listen to my instincts. Whereas when I was younger, um, I had instincts that I would follow, but I didn't always question why. Like, what well, what was this choice about? Now, when I make instinctive choices, I'm able to sort of analyze them. And realize that they either work or don't work, you know. So it feels less experimental now. Even when I'm being experimental, I now have a certain level of, of maturity to understand. Well, what was this inner thought in the back of my head to make this choice, and why does it work? Whereas before, when I was younger, I would make a, a, a crazy choice that felt right, and that's as far as I as I took it. And then either it worked or it didn't, you know. But now I think I'm much more successful because I can listen to that inner voice. I can listen to instincts and then i can also analyze it and so you don't feel like maybe you get as as like if somebody said that's really cartoony you wouldn't throw you off your game as much now oh no plus i've gotten weight over that stuff you know um i've had those arguments in my head i mean i'm cart i'm cartoony but arthur adams isn't right you know it's just more lines <laughs> you know i i'm cartoony but john byrne isn't Right. That's cartoony stuff. Like it's, you know, Neil Adams is pretty close to being yeah, realistic, it's but it's still cartoony. About yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Right. Well, it's funny because I think that older generation of people, like Jack Kirby, would say he was a cartoonist. And then in the 70s, you were an artist. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it's funny when you were cartoony stuff. Like if, if you saw Charles Schultz strip in a museum, you wouldn't question it. If Charles Schultz, this is modern art. Absolutely. But right. then Bruce Tim too cartoony, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's just that's human nature, I guess. Not enough veins. <laughs> <laughs> I've have a couple more things for you guys, and then we're going to let you go pee. But um, this has been a really great night so far. Thanks so much for hanging out so with far. us. What's going to happen? <laughs> You're going to go about your now. Business. Here's here's the part. Here's the part of the podcast where we shit the bed. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we'll uh, get the tan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mike, I, I would be remiss to talk to you and not mention my Templar, uh, which was one of my favorite things of yours. And a thing I was going to ask you earlier is, since you've done so many things and with you and Taki and Taki and you and all this, I'm sure you have fans who are fans of certain things you've done. Right, yeah. uh, like you might have, hey, when's more powers coming? Or, yo, when are you gonna do more of this? Or when's more Aries gonna have, whatever. Um, can you talk a little bit about Mice Templar and maybe the corollary between like working with Glass versus powers and working with Bendis or even the collaborative uh, nature of doing big full scale projects like that? Um, I mean, Mice Templar is one of my most favorite things that I ever created. And I was happy to get to do it with my close friends. Um, and then later we brought in Victor Santos when um, I made the move from Jersey to working in Valve. I couldn't handle that and my other work at the same time. And, and, and Victor Santos took over the art chores and we eventually made him an equal partner on it. Um, and that's a world, you know, I hope to return to one day. You know, I'm, I'm not announcing anything. There's no solid plans. But um, we are going to, I'd love to return to it one day, you know, mm -hmm. it is still, it's a world I could live in, you know, mm -hmm. you know um, it is one of the, the books 
Like if if you held a gun to my head, like you can only draw one thing, I, I couldn't answer you. But my Templar's in the top three, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know he and, and and Bendis are very different kind of writers. Like the process is very different. Um, Brian is Brian Glass is very much like an, an architect writer. Like he very thinks very hard about everybody's character arcs and the act structure. Um, Brian Bendis is a little bit more freewheeling. Um, so a lot of times when we talk about powers, it's, it's just in general wide terms. And then Brian will give me a, a Bendis will give me a complete script with Glass. It's, it's, it's long conversations about very specific things, you know, and we really talk about all of the, the specific specifics of it. Um, so there's really different sort of processes of, of that. And, uh, but they both, um, like, dress yeah. act it out right oh uh, yeah 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 they both acted out brian likes to do a lot of brian, brian bennis likes to do a lot of like car slides and rolling with the gun and brian Glass likes to just roll he, does, he rolls a lot <laughs> he likes to tumble <laughs> <laughs> but yeah we hope to return to it someday um there's some completions of like the the trades the hardbacks which were super super pricey we like to figure out one day and stuff and yeah, so no announcements or nothing right now, but yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, I love never it. say never. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, one thing that Mike and I connected on a long time ago, besides breakdancing, was uh, Lord of the Rings. So when uh, when my simpler came out, I was like, wow. And you could really tell that Oming was like scratching a very specific itch with that project. So good. good yeah. That was a big part in making sure that, that it wasn't just tropes from Lord of the Rings. You know, he built a real world mythology around it and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a question uh, in that realm from Mr. Flowers for you, Omi. Has, have, has he, have you <laughs> read Walt Simonson's Ragnarok or purposefully avoided it to not tread into similar territory? Tell me about this this Simon, Simonson person? Who, who is a Simonson person? Simonson. Simonson. Uh, I think he's, he's probably specifically talking about Walt's new book, uh, uh, Ragnarok, as opposed yeah. to like the Thor Ragnarok stuff. Um, and yeah, like when I remember earlier, I was talking about how I work on things ahead of time. Mm -hmm. uh, and then sometimes there's a danger that somebody else can have something that, that's similar. When I saw Walt's Ragnarok story coming out, because my, my after, after Realm book is about what happens after Ragnarok. His Ragnarok book is about what happens after Ragnarok. Luckily, they're in very, very different directions. Um, but I did shit a brick. Uh, mm -hmm. And I got like flashbacks to Mice Templar and Mouse Guard, which were developed literally at the same time. Um, just of the same age and same influences and stuff. Um, and then Walt's a big influence on me. So in this case, I would have probably just backed off completely and totally changed my direction. Yeah. Um, that was when I had to get the dust pan too. Yeah, because I should have dusted brick. brick. <laughs> uh, so yeah, and, and then I read it, and there's nothing he's doing that I felt I was going in the same direction of, um, especially because my mission statement on, on in, in After Realm is I'm really drawing on all my, the uh, best way to put it is sort of like prepubescent fantasies. You know, you're watching a lot of like Thunder of the Barbarian and I'm playing Dungeons and Dragons and I'm playing Santa video games at 7-Eleven and the toys and stuff. Like I was really reaching back to my earliest mm -hmm. influences and working those into this book. So while on the, the surface of it, it seems to be about Norse mythology after Ragnarok, a lot of it is sort of just going back to my childhood and playing things out. Mm -hmm. um, to the extreme, I mean, I even wrote my aunt who passed away recently. She was supposed to be the spirit guide who was originally, there's this cow creature in the beginning of, of Norse mythology that, that licks this cosmic ice and brings out the first being, which is this giant emer. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the cow, Amdala, Amdala, I, I can't say her name correctly, uh, was going to be the spirit guide. And then I thought, well, why not my aunt? <laughs> who she just passed and she's like my spirit guide and I wrote her into it in a way mm -hmm. and then you see stuff like Joust is in there the, the video game Joust as a kid just blew my mind so it's yeah. got the Joust stuff in there so those are the things that kept me safe from whatever Walter was doing um, and I love what he's doing in, in, in that book and it's amazing to, to look at and he's an idol and one of the reasons why I do Norse mythology and stuff so well, you know. 
Walt hangs around in the chat a lot, so I wouldn't be surprised if he pops up. Awesome, dude. Yeah. <laughs> um, so here's another one. And something that pops up a lot in a lot of our conversations, especially with people around our age, uh, I'll speak specifically to like Oming. 28, 29? Yeah, to Oming and me, and not really Mike, is that um, a lot of the late 90s, 2000 people uh, really cut their teeth on message boards on the early internet. And one of those famous things was the mob board, the Mac Oming Bendis, <laughs> three headed monster that you guys had. And I think that's probably where I connected with Oming was I was a, a, a foo, I was a friend of Oming. <laughs> the foo, those are great names. You were the foo, right? The friend of Oming. <laughs> So I have a I have a question for Rob Riley, uh, patron, <laughs> saint, Rob. patron patron saint of indie comics. Rob asks for all of us: Are there any other mediums or avenues you'd like to work in other than comics? Oh, Thanks, okay. Rob. Archaeology. There you go. I'm not being an archaeologist, I had to do it over again. Um, <laughs> but no, I mean it's comics, and you know I'm I'm interested in dipping my toe into other like I said opportunities. But I mean comics is definitely my home. Um, I mean, that's something I really learned when I worked at Valve, um, which was a great experience. And it's why I, I work digitally now, um, working at that video game company and being surrounded by all these other artists was one of the best creative experiences of my life. But I also became a functioning alcoholic while I was working there. Uh -huh. And I don't mean that as a joke. Like, I was, it was hard, man. You yeah. know, was, now it, was, that, was that for the stress? Yeah. Or, or um, was it the culture? The job wasn't stressful. My life was stressful. Mm -hmm. uh, so I work all day at, at Valve, but because my heart really is in comics, I'd come back home and then work all night on comics, so in powers and stuff. So I'd work, I'd come back home at 6 o'clock, I'd eat, and then draw till 11 o'clock, get up, go to Valve, work and draw there, come back home, draw, mm -hmm. draw, draw. Um, so yeah, I mean, my body and my mind and everything told me, it's like, like Taki would ask me every year, are you done? You yeah, know, like, she could see it. Yeah, if we need to start planning, then that's totally fine. You yeah. Know? So yeah, I mean, what other opportunities I have, I'll 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 take them on, but I'm all about making comics one way or the other. Okay, that's nice. Thanks, Ryan. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was just I thought uh, a little bit about just how strong the early internet. This is all like I guess you could say pre Google is the was the era of the message board and oh once, yeah, yeah. And once google, message boards. right and once google happened all that stuff kind of fell away because you could find answers to anything now for the community the community building was different twitter kind of like i remember when twitter first came around was when i think a lot of interest in message boards kind of fell away right right yeah so rather being someplace and kind of tacking, on, jumping on Oming's back and riding him out <laughs> around, you could have your own voice and you could have like, like Mike said earlier, your own bullhorn, right? Yes. So, so it kind of ate away at the message board system. But yeah, that was a lot of fun. The message boards were much more personalized. And I, and I think like, that's how I really like, I, but mainly I got to meet him at local New Jersey cons. And I think I started talking to you through the message boards and we hung out a couple of times like in Philly and I ended up drawing you in powers, like we had a, that, that stand up. Yeah, I was looking for that, for that. I can't find it. I, I wanted to put it on the thing. That's great. Yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's just like the power of community at, at play. Uh, Taki, I have another question for you, and then we're going to start wrapping you guys up. Uh, Stuntkin, the MVP of the night, says, Taki, do you try to know who your artist is before coloring their work? So you can match their work and create a perfect balance and feel like one entity. And there's one more part. Okay. As opposed to assuming what you think colors should be and ending up completing conflicting with the artists. Well, I don't know that answer because <laughs> I've only colored either Mike or myself. You did one coloring job. In a, a, with Chelsea, with her. With oh Steve, yeah, or? uh, yeah, but uh, but uh, yeah, but that was for charity, charitable stuff. So, um, but yeah, um, so it wasn't like a. Her process is to get to know and marry the artist first. 
<laughs> when I'm a law game, right? Um, <laughs> I've yet to figure out how to marry myself, but <laughs> we'll figure it out. <laughs> um, so going back to that, uh, what you guys would do elsewhere, are you, we're all in this boat, we're all in the comics boat, we're all like team comics. Uh, is there anything that you guys would see in the foreseeable future, not to like drop hints or anything, but just uh, anything you, like to experiment with, like maybe try to do webtoons thing or experiment with TikTok or do something like a Quibi animation or anything like that? Are you guys thinking about spreading out into different platforms? All the time. Um, like I said, you know, I think uh, limiting yourself, I think is just limiting yourself, quite literally. So. Yeah, I want to try anything and everything as long as my body allows. You know, um, like, unlike my, like, uh, I don't want to go into archaeology, <laughs> <laughs> but if comics didn't exist, um, I would I would actually would love to write, um, be in a writer's room for, like, a, a TV show. That would be a dream. Um, but, you know, but comics uh, speaks a little bit louder, but you know, they're, yeah. you know. I'm always excited to try out other stuff. Um, I have a Patreon right now. It's just uh, it's just a, a simple, like a dollar. And all I'm posting right now is just high res images. Cause mm. for a while I had like all these different tiers and stuff. And I think I, I heard Mike talk about this before, like how much work there is. And when I had started my Patreon, I didn't have as much on my, my desk yeah, and then like a month later, I'm like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> a lot of work. So uh, yeah, I just stripped it down, and it's still there. Um, so you know, maybe in the future, I'll run like a web comic on it or something. I have done some webtoon stuff. It was I just ran um, kind of a, I broke the model of it, you know, and I ran like full pages of comics on on webtoons for a bit. Mm. Um, I've done web comics way back in the '90s, so I'm I'm always excited to try different stuff. Like I said, I did an infinite scroll thing. Um, which I've not published yet. Um, I'm always taking chances. Like there's always, you know, a new company or, or a new, yeah, just like there, if there's an opportunity to try something different, we're, we're, we're down as long as it's about comics. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe last thing, if Mike doesn't have anything else, you said on our, on your Twitter before we went live that you were going to, you're going to tell us something. <laughs> um, uh, we're we're working on a on a project. For me, it's a dream project, a, a dream project I never could have possibly imagined would make sense to ever happen. Mm. Uh, so it's for uh, a, a Doors comic book. That's a graphic novel. Um, I believe it's uh, Z Tunes, the publisher, uh, or Two Z. I should know my publisher's name. Um, it's written by uh, Leah Moore, mm. and uh, Taki's coloring it, and it's about Jim Morrison in the afterward life, like after he dies, and he's wow. like. Hey, it's, so it's this like, it's this trippy, slightly esoteric, dreamlike story, and it's perfect for my every like I was talking like I, I well, but uh, what's really incredible about this is that uh, I think the artists were all lined up by the time that they approached us, and they were gonna just like they were like, oh, tell us which band you you're interested in, and see if you can see. If something can happen and you know doors is all like everybody's figured out like which artist is going to do what pages or whatever and just one artist just happened to be drop unavailable out drop out so they asked like we hey, might do want to draw doors and he's just like yeah. Hell yeah and it's such a specific story like i said it's this like cosmic trippy slightly esoteric kind of thing um it never would have made sense to ever pitch anything like that. And somehow it came to me. And I need to thank Rance Hosley, who, who reached out to me. He's the editor um, on it. And he specifically was like, you want to try this? And then I don't know if he knew about my love of the doors and specifically like Morris's poetry stuff and whatnot. Um, but uh, but it worked out. And uh, so I'm super excited about it. It's like a 12 page story. And um, yeah. yeah, so that's that. Pretty, pretty exciting. Oh, that sounds amazing. And thanks for thanks for breaking that on pencil to pencil. Breaking news. <laughs> where, 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 where's your uh, where's your Chiron with the uh, 
the breaking news. Oh man, I, I, I would type it real quick. That's how fast I am. <laughs> breaking news. <laughs> there you go. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's great. I'll get the dust pan. <laughs> Uh, Mike, you have anything for these guys before I kick them out? Uh, you know, I just want to thank everybody for tuning in. Oh, <laughs> different mics. No, no, oh, no, yeah. no, no. Mike is me or Mike is <laughs> manly. <laughs> manly. Um, and so that project will carry you through to what, the end of the year? No, it's a 12 page story. <laughs> so um, I'll probably be done like late next week or something. Okay. <laughs> Um, but on top of that, you know, After Realm is still ongoing. Um, I've got a project, like I said, I'm doing with Victor Santos. Taki and I have some other project. I'm working on something with David Walker, which we've, we're kind of working on on our own time. Um, we've got pages for that already. Um, I'm probably missing something else. But, you know, like I said, I'm kind of juggling several, several different things. Um, Do you like that? Do you like juggling? Is that part of your... Do you yeah, get, like yeah. antsy if you do one thing too long. Mm -hmm. No, I can do one thing for a long time. Like yeah. like Kate Carson was a blast. Right now, like to be quite frank, like this, we're in a really weird space right now, right? Like we, this pandemic, this uh, the economy is failing, and there's just a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of uh, civil unrest and you know fire <laughs> that we're experiencing and uh we currently have like the the worst air quality on earth uh in this area um so you know like we we're constantly like uh checking with each other like okay so what do we want to do and like make lists of like things we want to do we want to work on and uh create jobs for ourselves too, you know, um, because there's no guarantees. Yeah. And we I, you know, I, I love doing work for higher stuff at Marvel DC, you know, like the, those things are fun. Absolutely. The, and that's where a big chunk of my career is and stuff. And I can't wait to do more. And I just did some young justice stuff and that was a lot of fun. Um, but you know, creating work for ourselves is something we're just constantly thinking about, you know, a lot of like you guys, you know, it's like, there's, there's nothing more rewarding than being self self-dependent. Mm -hmm. No, I, I agree with that. Um, That's the most security you can have in the long run is to have your own assets, your own intellectual property. Um, and I think the generations coming up now have a, um, a real possibility of doing that right from the start, which was much harder as we were talking about earlier. So, yeah. Yeah. That's a good way to frame it. You know, just being able to, I, I think options, options are the greatest thing anybody could have, whatever industry you're in is just being able to pivot if you need to, or yeah. find, find another exit out of the place. If you need to. <laughs> It's super important. Well, this is certainly the year of the pivot. Everybody's pivoting, constant pivoting. Yeah. yeah. So, I'm really grateful we were already looking into like uh, there's Kickstarter stuff where we were talking to lit agents about a year ago mm -hmm. um, for graphic novel stuff. And, and it had nothing to do with the state of the industry. It was just I wanted to do other things. Um, so, it's it's, yeah. So, yeah. you know, we were kind of in decent footing for all these changes because. So have just having a little bit of a head start on the gun during these times is important, you know. That's a bad metaphor right now, but you know, no, no. yeah, I, I totally understand where you're coming from, and I think it's good for anybody that's listening or uh, fans of any of us is to just know that beyond the, the, the love of the fandom of Marvel or DC or whatever, that it's still really important to kind of have your foot. <laughs> in a in in a place where you can kind of control what you're creating, or yeah, say, what you're creating. Every, every creator should ask. They should be investing in themselves, and almost everything you do, ask yourself, how does this come back to me in the future? Uh, sometimes it's an easy answer. It's work for hire. It's money to pay the rent, you know, to pay your mortgage, to take care of stuff. It's super practical, mm -hmm. but you also have to look at like, well, how how is that going to serve me in the long run? That's right. I oh. Think about 
Oh, you know what? Uh, oh man, I found that page. <laughs> Yay! Uh, <laughs> yeah! <laughs> I love it. Look at that handsome young man. I know. Look at that. Look at look at that young face. <laughs> That's great. No. Oh yeah. I, Dude, my I almost hurt myself laughing while I was watching your your um, interview. Was I'm not sure if it was Hawthorne or if it was Spike, but there was a picture of you as a child, and you have almost the exact same hat. Oh, like, like you're a yeah, yeah, so my oh my what, are, what are my baby pictures? Yeah, wasn't that great? <laughs> he was born, the doctor slapped him and put the hat on, and that was it. Yeah, I got to stay on brand. Stop <laughs> branding at age three. That's right. It's really important. Oh my God. <laughs> All right. Well, you know what? We, we had a great time hanging out with you guys. Um, for Taki and Omi, do you want to uh, tell people where they can follow you on the socials and how they can pick up some of your work? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm mostly only on Twitter. Well, it's Taki Soma on uh, Twitter. Um, not really on any other ones, uh, actively. So mm -hmm. but I'd like to change that hopefully yeah. soon. You're getting more used to it. Tip uh, you yeah. Tip you don't toe into the water. Yeah. But you can find me on, you know, Twitter, very active Instagram. Um, I have a professional Facebook page and it's almost all just at oming or under oming. Mm -hmm. um, pretty easy to find. Uh, and that's about it. Very cool. All right. Well, you know what? I hope that we can have both of you back uh, in the future. Uh, this was really cool. It was great catching up with you and great getting to know Taki a little better. Yeah. Um, I hope, if anything, we've taken a, taken a nice chunk out of your, your day. Oh, that was great, man. We needed to change. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we can't even open the windows. Come on. Oh, it's yeah. a long, long day for like, yeah, it's just too yeah. much. And it was good for me to, to catch up with you both. Like I've, I've known Mike since I first started breaking into comics and then you shortly later. And, um, you know, I miss you guys. And even before all this crazy stuff, like I really hated the only thing I hated about not going to cons anymore was just missing out on old pals like you guys and catching yeah. up. Yeah, mm -hmm. I would say that that was the thing for us that, that we always enjoyed the most was getting a chance to see each other. Yeah. You know? So this is nice. Yeah. This is good. Yeah. All I'll right. Do it. Great. So now I'm going to Zoom you guys every day and just stare at you while you're no. working. <laughs> <laughs> you might get bored. <laughs> like, is he, is he still on the Zoom? Doesn't he? Can't he leave now? <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys. Thanks. Have a great night. And, uh, all right. Be safe. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Take care. Bye. And... Oh. Bye. <laughs> uh, that was great. Uh, that was fun. Um, it was good catching up with those guys. Uh, Quite enjoyable, my friend. And, um, you know, Mike, like I said, Mike has been in the kind of in the conversation for a long time. I don't think this was a modern master's book, but I remember somebody had like a five hour interview with Mike Oming, and I think they made a book out of it or it was like a couple of CDs or something like that. And it's just, you know, very interesting just to talk shop with people who have uh, been in the game and just doing really pro uh, uh, prominent things. Like even that, um, the Powers show, which I, we didn't talk about too much, is very interesting, like that hit right before the streaming explosion, right? And I wondered like if that happened six years later, would it be like in the conversation, like all this other stuff now, you know? And it's it could be, you know I mean, you're, you're your window of success can be so affected. If, like I said before, if somebody like Jeff Smith was starting now, he probably couldn't get bone off the ground in the direct market because of the way everything is, mm -hmm. is set. Or he would probably have to do everything online. So who knows how that would change, change things. So, yeah. You know. it, yeah. Things change so quickly. And, you know, we talk about timing a little bit too, like, and just, you know, going back into how Hollywood projects may never happen. So if you ever talk to comic book people and they're like, Oh, yo, I heard, didn't you think it option? And people say things like, yeah, or 
your your energy is so low about it is because you one you might not be able to talk about it and two is that things just don't happen or they do happen and things take so long you have well, to yeah i mean i i had that experience with a with the thing that i pitched with uh, bill ray yeah you know um, yeah i think it was five four or five years mm -hmm. of you just hurry up and wait yeah and you, they give you feedback and then though, the whole time you're thinking like well if this does happen, I guess I'm going to have to move to L.A. Right. Just move there temporarily to work on the pilot. And then if they get the pilot, you know, there's the stage where you go through and get the pilot, but they don't choose the pilot. Right. So right. there's like a lot of like. And I was in school at the time. Right. I just this is like 2008. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's like how long can you juggle that ball? Right. right. It's right. different if you lived in L.A., then it wouldn't right. make any difference. But if you're going to say, well, you know, I live in New York or I live in Philly, I'm going to move all the way, you know, and then you might lose your option. They may reoption it again. You know, um, there are no I know people we both know people that, you know, they just keep renewing the option. <laughs> right. You know? Like right. I'm sure, like, for instance, with something like the Phantom. Mm -hmm that option for that character is probably always active. They have not done anything with it since the Billy Zane movie. Slam you know, evil. You know, and they had a little talk, what, a year or two? Right after I started working on the, uh, the strip mm -hmm. about there being somebody was going to do something and then, you know, maybe that person leaves, falls off, the rights come back, they renew it, or they don't do it. Somebody else, you know, Universal drops it. United Ar Artists picks it up. You get a, you get a, an actor, and because you get the actor, you get the director. But then the director gets another offer, and the actor gets another offer. You know, it's like you have to have so many mm -hmm. things align, and then it's, it can still be a complete piece of shit in the it's end. It's almost like here's my analogy of the night. It's almost like a slot machine. Where the things like the three columns are going, doo -doo 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 -doo, bing, like seven, seven, and then you get a bar. Right. I think you know? the only thing that changes that now is if you have develop a fan base, you can do your own Kickstarter. And I think we're going to see more of that. I think you're actually going to see people do actual movies, maybe even eventually multi million dollar movies where they will be funded by fans, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, there might be a creator, uh, just you know, like somebody say, like Bruce. Bruce Tim wanted to do something, and he mm -hmm. wasn't at Warner Brothers. A guy like that, Mignola, people like that. If you have enough of a fan base, you probably could get those people to give you enough money that then you can get the other people to want to chip in. You know what I mean? Oh, so, you know, there's also this is another area that I don't think we talk about enough is the idea of doing things that go viral. I wouldn't wind my watch by viral things, but one of the things that's been in my head lately is this: these guys made a fake trailer for a Fresh Prince of Bel-Air remake that was like dark and like there was lots of Dutch angles and it was very like a serious, somber type of thing. And the internet blew up and you know, it was like for Bel-Air. Dun, dun, dun. And people are like, yo, this is so fresh and it's dope, blah, blah, blah. Long story short, Will Smith saw it. They just signed a deal. There's a two year, uh, I mean, a two season right, yeah. deal for this new Bel Air show off the strength of a, U a YouTube video. You know what I mean? So there, I mean, there's ways for things to happen. There may not just be the same way as, like, say, when you started, where you'd have to sit in the lobby at marvel <laughs> hoping to show your pages there's ways of getting your things in front of people these days that can oh, yeah. pay off oh yeah i think i think i think we're just in the very beginning we're the very beginning of that and i think that uh, with the pandemic <laughs> just read was it yesterday i think it was a drug company in india said that there probably will not be enough vaccine until 2024 yeah, so if, if they find a vaccine and they can't make enough to give it to everybody for 2024, 
that's going to destroy the movie business because people are not going to be probably going back into theaters. Yeah. So all these other avenues are going to be created because no matter what, people want to be entertained, you know, and people have money and they still want to make movies. They still, they still have to make stuff for these streaming services. So uh, I think it'll just end up creating more and more and more uh, uh, opportunities because the demand for the product will be there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, all right, we're gonna we're gonna put this to bed. Uh, we had a great chat with Mike Avon Oming and Taki Soma. Uh, it was great that Taki could hang out with us. Yeah, uh, uh, that was a cool. That was an unexpected uh, surprise. It was really co- it was really cool. We could talk about that, and also the uh, creative partnership of uh, husband and wife. Uh, being creative partners. I think that was really cool. Uh, I want to give a blast real quick to our Saturday guest, Mike Manley. Um, where's, where's my... Dun, 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 Tony Bancroft! Tony Bancroft! Tony Bancroft! Disney animator and director, Tony Bancroft! <laughs> I like that face. Yeah, man. That's right. Um, it's going to be amazing. Uh, Mike, you want to do a quick plug for Tony and um, about uh, kind of how we got all this set up? Because you you're a big fan of the Bancroft podcast, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, I listen to the, to the Bancroft Brothers podcast with uh, 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 Tom and Tony uh, Bancroft. They do uh, a podcast on animation where they uh, like pretty much like what we do, where they interview people that they've worked with and have a a wide variety of people have worked in animation over the years. Uh, they both, you know, worked on many, many, many uh, mm-hmm. Disney films, probably, uh, you know, like Mulan and, mm-hmm. uh, and well, uh, and then Tony was the director or co-director on uh, Animal Crackers. Yeah. Uh, so, oh, uh, Christian Sava's yeah, yeah. Uh, movie on well, Netflix. Yeah. 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 So, um, uh, I wanted to uh, see if we could talk to him, and also because you know I love animation and and uh, 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 was one of the early and still is a big interest of mine. You know, um, I I often think about uh, if things had gone one way or the other at a certain point, it might have actually gone into animation even more than comics. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, um, so yeah, so Tony will be on. Saturday to talk about the film and his podcast and his career uh, uh, working. Uh, he has a, a, a great storied career in the field of animation. He also teaches. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's going to be exciting. <laughs> JRD says, Animal Crackers, Tony Bancroft? Yes, JRD, that is exactly correct. Uh, we're excited to uh, have him on and we'll have a good show. So I will say for everybody who's watching this for the first time, thanks for sticking it out with us. Um, Please like and subscribe on YouTube or follow us on our Facebook channel. There's always goodness to come, and we're always back Wednesday and Saturday nights at 8 p.m. EST. Uh, Spread the word. That's right. So we're going to go home. So uh, thanks for joining us again uh, for my good bud, Mike Manley. I am Jamar Nicholas. You know what happens next. Wash your hands and then a show of Kirby hands. Have a good night, guys.